Welcome to the July, uh, June 27th, uh, 2023 public hearing and public meeting of the Municipal Preservation Commission will begin this morning by taking attendance. And I'll ask our general counsel, Mark Seven, to call. Chair Kettle. Here. Vice Chair Bland. Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Chen. Here. Commissioner Chu. Here. Commissioner Ginsburg. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi, she's here. Um, Commissioner Master. Here. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. Good morning again, and welcome to our public hearing and public meeting today, June 27th, 2023. We are uh, meeting in a public hearing on 1 Central Street. We also have a remote option for the public who wish to participate remotely, and information on that. You can be found on our website, the caring page of our website. And we'll also be live streaming our proceedings today on our YouTube channel. So if anyone would like to just watch the proceedings, then we do so by going to our YouTube channel. We're going to begin this morning with a public meeting agenda from by the research department, uh, which we will be proposing. Uh, presenting three proposals for designations, and then we will move to our preservation department agenda to review applications for work on designated properties. Okay. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to our director of research, Caitlin Miss McHale. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you in person. Item number one this morning is LP 2670 935 St. Nicholas Avenue building, 935 St. Nicholas Avenue, aka 929 to 939 St. Nicholas Avenue, 462 to 466 West 157th Street, Manhattan, block 2107, lot 72. Item proposed for designation is a Gothic Revival style apartment building built in 1915 and designed by architects Cronenberg and Lichtag, which for many years was home to legendary jazz musicians Duke Ellington and Noble Sissel. Presenting this morning is Teresa Noonan. Good morning. Terry, if you could click on your on the presentation and then you should be able to move the slides again. Great. At the public hearing on June 6th, representative of Manhattan King Community Board Twitter and the historic district house testified in support of this case. In addition, the commission received correspondence in support of designation from the New York Landmarks Conservancy and Save Harlem Now. There was no testimony was received in opposition of designation. The 
The building is located on the corner of St. Nicholas Avenue and West 157th Street. At the south edge of Washington Heights, located one block north of Hamilton Heights and Sugar Hill Historic District. The proposed landmark site is the tax lot. St. Nicholas Avenue was designed by Harmon, Cronenberg, and Albert Lutz and built in 1915. The architects specialized in apartment buildings, and their designs represent, were represented in several Manhattan historic districts. Their use of the neo-Gothic revival style for this building was rare for the park, and it stands out in the neighborhood. The handsome building features textured brickwork and elaborate terracotta detail, and is highly intact. Despite the flourishing of the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s, census records indicate that it was not until the mid 1930s that the demographics of the tenants changed in the building and began to shift from predominantly immigrants from Russia and Eastern Europe to African American residents. The jazz pianist and composer Duke Ellington resided here from 1939 to 1961, a period of over 20 years. At the height of his political career. Because of his association with the building, it is a national historic landmark named the Duke Ellington Residence. Further research by the LPC staff found that Noble Sissel, the noted ragtime jazz musician and music producer, also resided here from 1950 to 1972 during the latter part of his career. When he remained, but he remained a significant and influential figure in the performing arts. Shown here with their orchestras, both Noble Sissel and Duke Ellington were successful composers and band leaders with the national crimes. Long association of these two major figures, each for more than 20 years, as a productive period of their careers, elevates the cultural significance of 935 St. Nicholas Avenue. Duke Ellington was born in Washington, D.C. in 1899 and became one of America's most innovative and prolific jazz orchestra leaders. From the start of his career in New York in 1923 and until his death in 1974, he composed over 3,000 songs. Having reached Having reached mainstream national audience through radio shows from the Cotton Club, Ellington moved to an apartment on the fourth floor of 935 St. Nicholas Avenue in 1939. Over the next two decades, while living here, he wrote many songs that have become American jazz standards, such as Sad and Down, Don't Get Around Much Anymore, and I Let a Song Go Out of My Heart. He also composed musical suites, including Black, Brown, and Beige, a portrayal of African-American history, and created music, film for music for films and television scores. Among his many honors and accolades throughout his illustrious career, Ellington was on the cover of Time Magazine in 1956, and he lived in St. Mary Nicholas Avenue and would later be awarded the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 1966 and the Presidential Medal of Honor in 1969. Noble Lee Sissel was born in Indianapolis in 1889 and moved to New York in 1916. During World War I, he was a member of the 369th Regimental Band organized by James Reese Europe, part of the African-American regiment known as the Harlem Hellfighters. Cecil began his collaboration with Uli Blake around 1914. Their musical Shuffle Along opened in 1921 and ran for more than two years. It was the first successful Broadway musical with an all-Black cast, 
and introduced such songs as I'm Just Worried About Harry, which would later be a campaign song for President Harry S. Truman, and many more. Not the least, this will later form his own orchestra and toured Europe and the United States from the 1930s to the 1950s, and appeared in movies and television shows from 1937 to 57. He was the president of the Negroes Actors Guild of America, which he founded, working to eliminate stereotyping of African, African Americans in theater and, and cinematic performances. Duke Ellington was co-vice president along with Ethel Waters and Marian Anderson and many others. During this time, Cecil lived at 935 St. Nicholas Avenue. From 1950 to 1972, he remained an influential figure known as the unofficial mayor of Harlem. And he wrote many articles for the New York Age and the New York Amsterdam News. He also had a local radio show on the station WMGM. Nine Thirty Five Saint Nicholas Avenue is architecturally and culturally significant as a reflection of northern, northern Harlem's history in the twentieth century and the history of jazz as an American art form. It retains a high degree of integrity to its original and mid-century period of cultural significance when it was home to jazz leaders. Duke Ellington and Moses for more than 20 years. The research department recommends that the commission votes to designate 935 St. Nicholas Avenue as an individual area. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Commissioners, do you have any questions for Terry or Kate? Okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm very excited about the proposals today. I think all three of these uh, proposals speak to the history of jazz in New York City and in the country, and I think really reflect how um, jazz is, the history of jazz is really embodied in the fabric of our city. And uh, that includes Harlem, but it also includes Queens, and I'm excited about the fact that we are able to represent that history uh, throughout the boroughs and um, and they all have long associations with the individuals um, and uh, uh, places that are significant and they all have a high degree of integrity in, and to their period of cultural significance so this a uh, particular building is really architecturally significant when you are on the street. It really stands out for its architecture. Um, and then, of course, it has this long association with Duke Ellington and Noble Sissel, two uh, really influential and important jazz figures, uh, both here for more than 20 years and with a little overlap in between and both when they're doing very important work. So I'm really excited about this proposal. I don't know if anyone else has any comments. On it no all right so okay so um commissioner ginsburg would you make a motion i will um i move that the landmark preservation commission designate 135 st nicholas avenue buildings Four sixty two to four sixty six West One Fifty Seventh Street, Borough of Manhattan, is a New York City landmark because of its special character, special historical and aesthetic interest, and value as part of the development, heritage, and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation, as set forth in the designation report for LP dash two six seven zero, dated June twenty seventh, twenty twenty three. I am also moving that the Bay of Manhattan tax map block 2107, lot 72, be designated as its landmark site as described in the design, designation report and illustrated in the attached map. Thank you. Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Commissioner Master? 
Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Right. 935 St. Nicholas Avenue is now our latest New York City landmark. And I'm delighted. Thank you, Terry, for all of your work on this, as well as Kate and the research team for the package of proposals we're looking at today. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Terry, for enduring our audio tech check during that presentation. Um, item number two is uh, LP2657, John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie Residence, 105-1937th Avenue, aka 34-68, to 68, 106th Street, Corona, Queens, Block 1747, Lot 51. Item proposed for designation mm -hmm. is a colonial revival style building home to legendary jazz trumpeter John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie from 1953 to 1965. Presenting again is Teresa Noonan. Good morning again. I am so proud to present the home of a musician who helped change the trajectory of jazz, not once but twice, through the invention of bebop and Afro-Cuban jazz. The legendary jazz trumpeter, John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie, purchased this three-story multifamily residence in Corona, Queens at the height of his career in 1953 and lived here until 1965. Beyond being Dizzy Gillespie's home for the longest period of any association located in New York City, this building also held a rehearsal space that became a space of music production and gathering for his band and the jazz community. It is culturally significant for its strong association with Dizzy Gillespie and his indelible contributions to the history of jazz and culture. At the public hearing on June 6, four people testified in favor of designation, including representatives from the Historic Districts Council and the Corona East Elmhurst Preservation Society, two and, and two individuals. Two representatives of the owner spoke in opposition. In addition, the commission received written correspondence in favor, in support, pardon me, of designation from Assemblyman Jeffrey Ann L. Aubrey, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and Save Harlem Now. The proposed landmark site is the building's tax lot located on the corner of 37th Avenue and 106th Street, just around the corner from the designated Louis Armstrong House. Dizzy was born in 1917 and became one of the most important jazz trumpeters, composers, and band leaders of the 20th century. He is best remembered as the co-founder of the revolutionary jazz style bebop with Charlie Parker as well as his contributions to the development of Afro-Cuban jazz. Built on the corner of 106th Street in 1922, the single family home at 105 1937 Avenue was converted to a three family residence circa 1940. The Lesby purchased the building in 1953 and lived here in an apartment with his wife, Lorraine who also served as his personal manager. The Gillespie's retained ownership of the building until 1985, a period of 32 years of ownership. Dizzy Gillespie died in 1993 and is buried in nearby Flushing Cemetery. During the period he lived in Corona, he adopted his signature bent trunk, composed and rehearsed music in the basement studio, and released and performed a succession of memorable albums, including, including Jazz at Massey Hall in 1954, Afro in 1950, also in 1954, World Statesman in 1956, Mintaka in 1958, and Jumbo Kareeb in 1964, among many others. He appeared at the historic first Newport Jazz Festival in 1954, among others. 
He toured internationally as America's first jazz ambassador and won many national and international awards. And he entered Downbeat Magazine's Hall of Fame in 1960. A 1960 article in the New York Daily News commented that Dizzy Gillespie owns an apartment in Corona, Queens. And because Dizzy lives there, it must be a mighty cool neighborhood. <laughs> At the time, the neighborhood was developing into an important African-American community, attracting notable jazz musicians, including Gillespie and his friend, Louis Armstrong, who had settled there in 1943. Research indicates that Gillespie's home became a center of jazz community in Quran, with many musicians congregating in his, in his rehearsal studio. Dizzy wrote the first version of his autobiography here, as shown in this photo. And the book, and from the book, Louis Armstrong, Jimmy McPartland, and Bobby Hackett with Dizzy at his home. Pianist Junior Mace recalled his years with Gillespie in his band from 58 to 1961. Probably my most profound learning experience. I remember spending several hours at a time in his basement studio, being shown chord changes that I never knew existed. During this period, the U.S. State Department chose Gillespie as the nation's first jazz ambassador in 1956. Conceived during the Cold War to promote American culture and democratic values, his band traveled extensively, performing to great acclaim in Europe, the Middle East, and South America. Following his return, he appeared on Edward R. Morrow's interview program, Person to Person, broadcast live from Dizzy Gillespie's Corona home. As a national figure, Dizzy Gillespie started a short-lived run for the presidency in June 1964. Inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King, he hoped to draw more attention to civil rights and voting rights. Though modest, the house retains its original form and colonial revival style features with only minor changes since the time Dizzy Gillespie lived here, mainly limited to replacement of original doors and windows. Because of its cultural significance as the home of the internationally acclaimed jazz composer and band leader, John, John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie at the height of his influential career and its integrity to that period, the research department recommends that commission vote to designate the John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie residence as an individual landmark. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Commissioners, any questions on this item? No? Okay. Um, I do want to say that when we had held the hearing, we heard um, many in support of this proposed designation, which we are grateful for. Uh, we also heard from the owners, representatives, expressing concern and opposition to designation. Um, and we're also grateful for their participation. And uh, we have worked very closely with them to work and talk through their concerns. And we will continue to work closely with them and uh, partner with them and assist them as they need to make changes to their building. I do want to point out that um, the building is overbuilt under the zoning, and so it it if if it were to be replaced, could only be replaced with something smaller. And um, and because of its modest architecture, I really don't believe that working with the Landmarks Commission will create a burden. Um, and hopefully, the owners will come to you know to embrace and celebrate the significance of their building. So we're we're going to continue to work with them closely. And we did talk a little bit the last time about um, the modest nature of this architecture. And I think Vice Chair Brand raised the question about buildings in New York City having lots of associations with significant people. And as we talked about, then, 
Um, the commission has always designated uh, based on architectural, historic, and or cultural significance. And usually it's a combination of the three. Um, but from the very beginning, LPC has designated modest buildings for their uh, cultural associations um, and really important history and cultural associations. So some examples of that are the church, church and workers' houses associated with the historic African-American community in Sandy Ground in Staten Island. Um, of course, more recently, Stonewall and Julius's Bar Building in Greenwich Village for its associations with LGBTQ plus history. And uh, similarly, other homes, so the home of James Baldwin, William Armstrong, Louis Latimer, most homes, but those seeking in many associations with the homes um, that they undertook some of their most influential works during their residence in their homes. And the, the buildings retain a high degree of integrity to their residence in the building association. And so I think, um, as we talked about New York being major capital, we have to be very rigorous in evaluating whether they should be designated. The research department uses very um, rigorous standards that are aligned with the, uh, the federal standards for listing on the National Register. And um, I really believe that this uh, is, a, is uh, completely in conformance with those standards and will be a, a, a brilliant addition to our New York City landmarks, and uh, particularly to our landmarks in this particular neighborhood in the corner from the William Armstrong House, and really speaking to the history of jazz and the collective um, creativity that happened in this community. So I hope that we can move forward with the designation today. So, okay, uh, Commissioner Chu, would you make a motion? Yes, thank you. I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate John Brooks Dizzy Gillespie Residence 105 1937th Avenue, aka 3468 106th Street, Borough of Queens, as a New York City landmark because of its special character and special historical and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development, heritage, and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation, as set forth in the designation report for LP 2657, dated June 27, 2023. I also move that the Borough of Queens tax map, the Rock 1747, Lot 51, is designated as its landmark site as described in the designation report and illustrated in the attached map. Thank you. And Commissioner Robert Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. Thank you, Mark. Will you call the vote? Sure, Carol. Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right. Our newest New York City Alarm now. Thank you. Item number three this morning is LP 2671, Hotel Cecil and Vinton's Playhouse Building, 206 West 118th Street, a.k.a. 150 to 158 St. Nicholas Avenue, and 206 to 212 West 118th Street, Manhattan, Block 1923, Lot 38. Item proposed for designation is the Renaissance Revival Style Hotel Cecil, um, home to the legendary nightclub Mittens Playhouse, where the pivotal style bebop emerged and flourished in the 1940s, transforming jazz and American music. And presenting this morning is Matthew Postal. The Hotel Cecil in Mittens Playhouse building was built in 1895 to 1896. It gained cultural significance in the mid 20th century when it was home to Mittens Playhouse a jazz club that flourished for over three decades. Famous for presenting innovative house bands, star headliners, and informal jazz session, jam sessions, it was here that the influential jazz style now known as bebop took shape in the 1940s, transforming American music. 
At the June 6th hearing, two people spoke in support of the building's designation as an individual landmark, including representatives of the owner and the Historic District's Council. No one spoke in opposition. The Commission also received letters in support of designation from the New York Landmarks Conservancy and Save Harmon, uh, Save Harlem now. Located in central Harlem, the Hotel Cecil and Mittens Playhouse building is a five-story structure at the southeast corner of St. Nicholas Avenue and West 118th Street. Hotel Cecil was designed in the Renaissance Revival style by Julius F. Monkwitz. Completed in 1896, this residential hotel advertised furnished and unfurnished suites as well as bachelor apartments. During the era of the Harlem Renaissance, the hotel was slow to welcome black patrons, but by 1940, it changed course and was listed in consecutive editions of the Negro Motorist Green Book, a popular guide that identified businesses that were friendly to African-American travelers, including a remarkable and varied list of long and short-term guests, including jazz, gospel, soul, and doo formers. In 1938 or 1939, the hotel's first floor dining room was converted to a restaurant and bar. Named for the owner, saxophonist and union leader Henry Minton, Minton's Playhouse was managed by the big band leader Teddy Hill. Under Hill's direction, it became a popular and influential music venue where many people claim the improvisational jazz style known as bebop was born. In 1941, Hill hired drummer Kenny Clark who, performed, who formed a small house band that included the legendary pianist Thelonious Monk. On Monday nights, when most clubs and theaters were dark, informal jam sessions frequently occurred, including such gifted musicians as guitarist Charlie Christian and trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie, who described these performances as seedbeds for our new modern style of music. In subsequent decades, a who's who of jazz would perform at Minton's Playhouse. Though critic Ralph Ellison questioned some people's memories of Minton's, in 1959, he described the club as a sanctuary, a shrine, and a rendezvous in which jazz men have worked out the secrets of their craft. Throughout the 1950s and the 1960s, Minton's Playhouse continued to be a prominent destination for jazz enthusiasts. Several albums were recorded on the premises, including performances led by Tony Scott, Stanley Turrentine, and Eddie Lockjaw Davis. The club remained open until 1974, when a fire caused the owner to abandon the building. <clears throat> Minton's Playhouse and the Hotel Cecil were listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1985. At the time, the structure was mostly vacant, with storefronts sealed with concrete blocks. The Hotel Cecil was rehabilitated with loans from the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development in the late 1980s, now operated as supportive housing for ho homeless men and women, the structure is well preserved. It retains many of its original architectural features, including the entrance to Mitten's Playhouse, which is on the right. Due to its major cultural significance, the research department recommends that the commission vote to designate the Hotel Cecil and Mittens Playhouse building as an individual landmark. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Oops. Any uh, questions for Matt or Kate on this one? Yes, my yeah, Commissioner uh, Goldblum. Um, so the building, um, the space that was the playhouse, is it now basically melded into the housing or is it a simple use? It, it's just the, the, the commercial space is on the ground that are separate from the residential spaces. <clears throat> and um, both of the businesses that are in these commercial spaces is what it's doing. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, again, I think this is an incredibly exciting proposal, um, a really significant place um, of jazz history and cultural history in New York City, and moving ahead with this item as well. Uh, so, Commissioner Eva uh, Jefferson, would you be willing to make a motion on this one? Sure. I move that the library of the city. six West 118th Street, AKA 150-158 St. Nicholas Avenue, 206-212 West 118th Street, Borough of Manhattan at the New York City Landmarks. Because of its special character and special historic and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development, heritage, and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and the nation. As set forth in the designation report for LP-2671, dated June 27, 2023. I also moved that Borough of Manhattan tax map, Block 1923, Lot 38, be designated as a landmark site, as described in the designation report and illustrated in the attached map. Commissioner Mass. Commissioner Master, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. 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 Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Master. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Uh, next, New York City Lamar. I want to thank you all. I'm really delighted with this package of designations, which happen to be uh, designated in this last week of Jazz Music Month, right? Jazz History Month, is that what it is? It was April. Uh, it was April, though. <laughs> Our jazz trio. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, Kate and team, for all of your work. Question? Yes. Uh, we have been actually. We've been doing a hip hop survey, uh, included in in the Bronx as well as elsewhere. Yeah. That's the next wave. Yes, absolutely. But we all have to try to stay six inches away, which I see breaking, but let's turn our mics off if we're not seeing that. All right, so with that, we'll now move to our Preservation Department agenda, and I'll turn it over to our Director of Preservation, Corey Harala. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll start today's Preservation Department uh, agenda with public meeting items, first of which is public meeting item number one, LPC 23-07630. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, Block 301, Lot 20, 34 Veranda Place in the Cobble Hill Historic District. This is a row house built in 1847, and the application is to modify the roof, install dormers, a chimney, and HVAC equipment, and alter the rear yard. Uh, this was uh, on a recent calendar, June 13th, 2023. It was read into the record, uh, but not presented at that time. So we'll be seeing it for the first time today and testimony will be taken. And this will be a remote presentation. Okay, and just uh, because we um, recently uh, read this into the record, we need to open up the hearing today. So Commissioner Woodsmith, would you make a motion to open up the hearing? So moved. And Commissioner Goldman, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is open. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, do you have control of the presentation? You just need to click on your screen. And then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Uh, the project team may begin, but please state your name for the record before you do so. 
Uh, hi, this is Brendan Coburn uh, presenting for the Brooklyn Studio. Uh, this project is um, a rather modest uh, uh, proposal, which is um, it has two components to it. One is to um, add some dormers to the front of the building facing Veranda Park. And I think actually, Abdu, if you could advance to slide LPC um, 05, that would be helpful. Um, Great. Um, this is uh, the so the the uh, the veranda uh, park facing portion of the work includes the addition of these two dormers on the uh, on the front facade and the raising roof um, to align with the ridge line of the adjacent buildings. If we could go to page LPC 06 for a moment, that would be helpful. Um, this is an overview of the block uh, drawing here. The existing condition is up above and the proposed condition is down below. Um, the uh, four row houses or you know, carriage houses, row houses that you see on the left side of the drawing, ours is the one that does not have a ridge. It's the lowest of the group. It is part of that set of four um, sort of 24 foot, well, three 24 foot wide carriage houses and one about 14 foot wide carriage house. Um, our project Abdu, if you could put a pointer on our project in the existing drawing, that would be great. Um, there you go. Our, our project number 34 is uh, two doors over from 38, uh, which has a dormer. Um, all of these buildings uh, to the left of our project had their roofs or their ridges raised so that they could have a full size um, or a half size floor in the back of the house. Um, at some point, uh, my office actually did 38 about 22 years ago, um, and we added this dormer at that time, and we raised the ridge at that time. Um, so we are proposing to um, follow that same ridge line that exists on the entire block, and in this case, add two dormers rather than one, one dormer. And um, we are doing this work for a family with three children, and so we are um, trying to get those three children stuffed into this floor that is currently tall enough for them at four feet, but not for once they grow. Um, the other part of this work, if we could go to the next slide, please, is to, uh, well, on the back side of the building, um, you will see that we are raising the roof or raising the third floor from its current level to align with the neighbor to the east. And that's what you're seeing on the right side of the drawing there. And we are also proposing to make a larger um, opening uh, on the garden and entry floor level at the rear of the yard, which you see down below. And this is not a double height space behind there. It's simply a larger opening that's articulated as though it is a double height space. Um, if we could look at the next drawing uh, sketch, please. Sorry, LPC08. Um, so this is just the context um, that we're working in. The drawings up above show the existing, and you can see our house is the uh, the smaller one of the row. And you can see that we are um, in the proposed drawing down below. We are raising our rear cornice to the same level as the neighbors on the block that had already done it. Again, the project over on the far right in this case, we did uh, about 22 years ago. Um, we raised it to align with the neighbor to the left and the neighbor to the right. So this is just completing that uh, modification to make this um, the third floor of this house uh, comfortable for people to actually stand up in. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, you can see some context for our project. Um, uh, that is the existing condition. The wall is coated with Thuraceal. Our plan is to clean clean that up, remove it. And you can see on the lower two slides, the neighbors to the east, uh, little Juliet balconies on the project over on the far right. And then um, and then our, our uh, the direct neighbor directly to our east right there. Next slide, please. Um, this is are some quick photographs of the rooftop mock-ups to show that they are there. Uh, you'll see the two dormers are in the upper right-hand photo and then an extension of the chimney in order to uh, provide the required clearances for the chimney. 
uh, our mock-up includes two air conditioning units in the back, which, uh, which we have removed from the project and are locating in the rear yard because they were excessively visible from Veranda Park. Um, this photograph in the lower left, it, it does show you uh, how the neighboring buildings have raised their parapets and their ridge line um, to accommodate uh, sort of full height rear half of the floor um, on the left. Uh, next slide, please. These are the context photos from Veranda Park. Um, and you can see our mock-up of the chimney up there in the lower upper right. And uh, that's probably the most visible of the elements from this proposal. And then you can also see uh, slightly the, um, the dormers themselves, or at least that one. Let's look at the next set of slides. Uh, so this set, it's all, it's, it's, it's more obvious. Um, you can see our two dormers right there. They are above the um, above the cornice line, so I think the the street wall is well maintained. And this is, I think, an effective strategy for adding some head height and some light and air to the low top floor. Um, next, please. Did we go to the next slide? Is it stuck? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, just some more shots. Obviously, Veranda Park uh, is a big public open space in front of these buildings, so there is um, there is very good visibility of our site. Um, but we believe that this project will, that these dormers will really disappear into this sort of uh, higgledy-piggledy of the roof line on this block. You can see other buildings have chimneys and fans and, and whatnot popping up here and there. We think this will uh, effectively disappear. And these are just a full set of uh, photographs of our mock-up. Um, and then just a quick building section. This is uh, our proposed condition looking, uh, cutting a section through the stair tower, a stair hall and looking both uh, east and west. So you can see the visibility from across the park and, and directly in front of the building. Um, you can see our building following the roof line there. And I think, actually, Abdu, if you could just go to the landing page, um, that would be it. So that, I, I believe, concludes my presentation. So there it is. Right, thank you very much. Questions? All right. Let me see if we have any sign-up sheets. No, uh, we have no in-person testifiers. We do have one uh, registered attendee who uh, will be testifying via Zoom. Uh, Christina Conroy, I will be uh, elevating you to panelist on Zoom. Uh, once you are in the panelist mode, you will have uh, three minutes to speak. We ask that you start by uh, stating your name for the record. Uh, good morning, uh, commissioners. Good morning. Yes, it's still morning. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society in New York. Um, our comments uh, on this multifaceted project will start with those areas which we find have the least effect. Uh, the sunken area way the applicants are proposing for the rear yard will not be visible from any street will not require removal of historic fabric and will be similar to those found in adjacent houses in this row. The HVAC units are to be set away from the facade and are small, so we support these changes. The chimney extension will be visible above the front facade, but because there are chimneys of varying sizes seen above many of the houses in this row and other parts of the district, we believe the proposed extension will not call undue attention to itself, so this change also gets our support. Now, we would not normally approve the proposal to raise the rear section of a roof and the rear cornice and extend the three top floor windows, but the photographs the applicant has provided show that existing cornice is minimally detailed uh, with a simple barge board instead of 
corbelled brickwork you see on more sophisticated buildings. The photos also show that every other house in the row has a raised roof and that the new roof at 34 will align with its neighbors. Since we don't feel that it is such an important detail that the quote, last example must be preserved in perpetuity, unquote, we support the changes to the rear roof and facade. Now that leaves the new dormers the applicant is proposing for the visible roof above the front facade. We see that at least one other house in this row has a similar dormer and find these new ones are modestly scaled. However, the position of these dormers seems to have been determined from the floor plan from the inside out instead of in relation to the existing facade design. The original builders of this modern house carefully positioned their front door and front window openings. This created a balanced formal facade using the simplest means. We believe that these dormers should be positioned with the same care. They could be centered above windows or above the existing brick panels, but they should not be dropped onto the roof like raisins dropped onto a cookie. Uh, we believe the dormers need to be repositioned in a way that will create a more unified facade design. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes the public testimony for this item. All right, did we receive our resolution from the community board? No, okay, we didn't receive a resolution from the community board. And just to confirm, uh, I just want to make sure there's nobody in like to speak on this item. Okay. All right. So um, I'd like to turn back to the applicant and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we heard. Um, I, I guess I would say I I you know for me architecturally the 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 break line of the cornice um, gives the architect greater flexibility in moving one's dormers around. I I I mean I would generally agree with what the, what the Victorian is society is saying about composition, but I think in this case where the cornice line is in fact so strong um, and the and the um, dormers are so sort of set back and utilitarian, I, I, I feel that it's a, it's a, a sort of appropriate use of the of the device in, in satisfying requirements of the floor plan. I, uh, the, 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 the location of them is without question driven by the interior floor plan and um, Given the location of the stair and and all of the things we're trying to fit into that space up there and three bedrooms, this is this uh, these dormers sort of design themselves into that location. But I, I, again, I think that the the strong cornice line allows for that sort of um, uh, sort of more randomly placed, if you will, dormer to occur without being a a uh, a problem with the overall composition of the facade. So that's that, that's it. See this across the, the park, uh, but and obviously, if you're looking straight on at the building, you would notice the asymmetry. But do you think if you moved um, to one side or the other, even across the park, whether you start to lose that that reading of uh, asymmetry because of perspective and uh, the angles? Thanks, Brendan. Okay. All right, commissioners, any other final questions? Let's make a motion to close the hearing. Commissioner John, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And this is a proposal for uh, to raise the bridge line and do to install two dormers. Um, whether that would be visible over the front um, in a row that has had other rooftop alterations, including another dormer further down that is also asymmetrical. And, um, and then at the rear to raise the height of the rear facade and install taller windows that align with the uh, adjacent houses in the row that have also been historically altered over time uh, to increase the ceiling height in the attic room. So we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Chu, would you like to start this one? Sure, thank you. Um, I think in general, if we look at the overall proposal from the front facade of the park view, well, I guess we can go one by one. Um, the borders on the roof, I think, are the only thing that seem to be 
a slight big question over in terms of their location. Um, I personally think that the corn is, does represent quite a large uh, break. Um, in fact, looking at the images provided, that corn seems to be even uh, more significant than the neighboring houses. Um, I find this uh, appropriate. I think that the small scale and nature of those donors does set it above and out of view in context from the facade reading. And because of the um, perspectives of the street, I think the unification of the street is really the bigger um, the bigger item that is of concern. And in this case, the, it seems like the street is being unified both from um, the front facade and the rear. Um, so I, I don't have any issues with this and I think it's an appropriate application. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Master? Oh, I agree. Okay. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, this is going to be appropriate. Commissioner Ginsburg? I like the raisin standard. I think that's something we should uh, in integrate into our formal proceedings, maybe as a rule. Uh, I, I think it's appropriate. Thank you. Commissioner Hoffman Smith. Um, I missed most of the presentation, but I, given everyone else's response, I would agree. Okay, great. So I think we can make a motion to approve this one. Commissioner Chu, would you make the motion? Yes. Um, in the case of LPC 23076303 for Vienna Place, Cobble Hill Historic District, a row house built in 1847, application is to modify the roof, install dormers, a chimney in it, and HVAC equipment, and alter the rear facade. Um, I recommend approval. Um, the staff does note that the building style, scale, material, and details are among the features that contribute to the special characteristic um, architectural and historic of the Cobble Hill Historic District. Um, again, I recommend improving the finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features. That raising the roof switch to align with the adjacent building will be hard modes with the other buildings in the row that the proposed dormers and chimney extension, which will be visible over the primary facade, will be seen in conjunction with a row of buildings with modified rooftops, a dormer, and chimneys, that the asymmetry of the dormers above the facade will not be evident when seen from most vantage points and the facade itself is not perfectly symmetrical that the proposed modifications to alt uh, to the rear facade, including raising the top floor windows and parapet, will align and harmonize with the other buildings in the road with similar conditions and will not be visible, visible from the public thoroughfare. And that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the, build, of the building or the Cobble Hill Historic District. Thank you. And Commissioner Minister, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you, Mark. You call the vote. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Lutfi. Commissioner Master. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With seven in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. And we'll move to the next item. Thank you. In the next item is public meeting item number two, LPC 23-09371. This is an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, Block 296, Lot 36, 169 Congress Street in the Cobble Hill Historic District. This is an Italianate style row house built circa 1850. The application is to modify the sloped roof to create a terrace, install a trellis, and alter windows at the rear facade. Uh, this was last on an agenda on June 13th, 2023. It was read into the record, uh, but it was not presented and no testimony will be uh, was taken at that time. This will be a remote presentation. We'll begin after we open the hearing. Thank you. And Commissioner Master, would you make a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Chair, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, Any opposed? All right, the hearing is open. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Rob and Kevin, you now have control of the presentation. You just need to click on your screen. And then you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Please state your name for the record. You may 
Sorry. Uh, hello, I'm Rob Lysing, a designer at Sachs Lindors as well. I'm also joined by Kevin Lindors, who's the lead architect, who can uh, also answer questions that you may have about this project. Um, and so our project is 169 Congress Street, a historic brownstone that's situated within the Cobble Hill Historic District, done in the Italianate style, as described in the designation reports. Through historical research, we have 1940s tax photos, as well as photos from the 1980s. Married to today, there have been minimal changes to the front facade since the 1940s. While our facade has not changed, the fronts of the two neighboring buildings have been raised above the cornice at 169, leaving a bright white waterproofing material used on the party walls and roof visible from the streets. The primary scope of work is a rooftop terrace, which is being built by partially demolishing the existing roof, as well as building a roof deck on the ex remaining existing roof. The modifications that are visible from the street level are uh, a painted thin brick veneer on the party wall of the east and west elevations, a painted steel guardrail on the front of the upper terrace, and a painted steel fence at the back of the upper terrace. The guardrails design is a simple and standard picket, similar in design and color to other rooftop guardrails, which are visible from Congress streets. The terrace fence is made of a lean painted steel frame with a thin stainless steel wire making a web for greenery. In the plan view, the front of the fourth floor will become an outdoor terrace. The rear side windows, which are non-historic, would be replaced with a row of outswing casement windows. At the roof level, uh, the upper terrace will be accessed by an exterior stair. Painted uh, steel guardrail will be in front and the painted steel fence in the rear with a required FDNY access gates. The photos on the left are the existing roof conditions. The images on the right are renderings of the proposed hair showing shade and texture of the materials. The materials were chosen to either match or complement the existing building. The windows will be painted black to match the existing historic ones, except the non-visible terrace windows, which will be painted black forest green. Terrace fence and steel guardrails will also be painted black forest green. The cast stone parapet will match in color and texture of the existing brownstone. The cladding on the new parapet and existing party walls will be thin brick veneer, matching the existing historical brick on the secondary facade will be painted Indian River to complement the existing brownstone. In surveying the historic district, we found numerous examples of brick and painted brick used on visible party walls on brownstones. A mock-up to uh, assess the visibility of the addition has been up um, since April 21st for the public to view. And this is a drawing of the existing north-south section of the project with Congress Street to the right. And here is the proposed section. Uh, the dashed line shows sight lines from three locations and the photos corresponding to these views. These locations are from the sidewalk across from Congress Street, from within Cobble Hill Park, and from Veranda Place. For clarity of the top of the cornice is drawn in the photos as a white line, the top of the guardrail in red, and the top of the fence in yellow, where the mock-up is obscured. Um, in an oblique view from the southeast toward Clinton Street, the metal guardrail is visible as shown in view six from the corner of Clinton veranda. The railings are code required for life safety and will be painted dark and will be visually like other rooftop guardrails in the historic district. Um, the dark apartment building visible in views five and six in the background will obscure the dark painted rail. Um, southwest, the oblique view from Veranda Place shows that a small part of the back fence will be visible, as shown in view nine. However, once completed, the fence will be filled with greenery that would blend into the existing foliage of Cabo Hill Park. On the rear facade, we are replacing the top floor windows with painted wood outswing casement windows with muttons that are consistent with historic windows. These are not visible from any public thoroughfare. 
as shown in this uh, with this rear facade study, there is no unifying window pattern within the block. 171 Congress does match, but 167 Congress has six over six windows that are not aligned and do not have similar sills or lintels. 65 Congress Street has two pairs of windows with larger masonry openings. For the right, both 163 and 161 Congress have only two windows each with large masonry openings, as can be viewed in the uh, our photos. Uh, and 171 and 167 Congress have also been modified to accommodate a through wall air conditioner um, pattern uh, that is continu continuous or consistent. Um, attached are the elevation plan and section details of the proposed windows, including the historic mud in profile that will be restored to the other windows. Here are the exam uh, are examples of similar casement windows in the historic districts. Uh, on the top floor of a visible secondary facade nearby 234 Clinton, a row of casement windows at 391 Henry, uh, as well as banded windows on the top floor of secondary facades at 238 Clinton within the block, and 130 Amity, which is visible from the rear yard of our building. And with that, we'd like to open up to questions uh, from the committee. Thank you very much. Should we still have any questions on this one? Yes, Mr. Ginsburg. Thank you for speaking. Now we're going to have to play in the small building. Sean, this is going to be the hardest. Mechanical equipment is that the electrified ability for him to clean up. Did he just sign off? <laughs> I agree. So not hard. Yeah. Right. Video is there, uh, Mr. Leasing or Mendoz? Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. There was a question just asked if the building was uh, being electrified as part of the renovation. Uh, why, sorry, what do you mean by being electrified? Uh, can you hear us? Okay, all right, we'll see if they can get back to us when the, uh, with that answer. And uh, so for now, let's, why don't we see if we have uh, testimony. I think we have Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. Yep, I'm right up to the microphone. Is that? The old way. I hope I'm speaking into the microphone. I hope this is working. It's lovely to see you all in person. Thank you for uh, having me here today. Um, HGC finds the proposed window alterations on the top floor of the rear facade to be inappropriate. The rear wall should retain its upper floor fenestration so that it remains consistent with the rest of the room. Thank you so much. We do not have any remote speakers with this item. Okay. All right. So I'd like to turn back to the applicants and ask if they'd like to make any final comments or maybe answer that question if available. Um, I'll ask. Uh, can, could we hear the question? We we don't couldn't hear um, what the 
question was asked by um, uh, Commissioner Chu, I, I believe. Yeah, but I'll, I'll just try to repeat the question. As part of your renovation and replacement of um, HVAC and mechanical systems, are you moving away from fossil fuels and using electric equipment like heat pumps? Yes, we'll be moving away from uh, gas uh, and moving towards uh, electric, electric for, uh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Questions, any final questions? Just one. Is that me? No. Okay. I have a question on the finish uh, specifications that indicates painted thin brick and thin brick. Where where is that being used? It says on terrace edition. Um. So specifically, the painted uh, thin brick would be used uh, on the terrace addition anywhere where it would be uh thin here it would be painted is the plan it's on the exposed party walls where where we're removing the roof but right now that there's a there's a waterproof membrane uh on that so the idea is that we would be re rebuilding a waterproof membrane and then putting a thin brick veneer on top of it uh, if I can get to volume, right? Okay, so just to explain, everyone, they are carving out the front part of the roof to create an inset terrace. Yeah. And it's those walls that get exposed by the buildings on either side that they intend to uh, apply the thin brick finish to. And you can see just a little sliver of uh, either side from you know kind of a distance from a public thoroughfare. So it's a newly created space, not an existing exposed historic wall. Thank you. All right, any other final questions? All right, let's move to close the hearing. Commissioner Lefty, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. So there are really two components to this application, the rooftop component, which includes uh, carving out the front of the roof to create a sunken terrace, uh, which is something we have seen in the past. And as has just been described, there will be these side walls with uh, brick veneer, painted brick veneer. And then above that, there is a trellis that has some minimal visibility. And then at the rear facade, the proposal is to combine the attic windows horizontally um, and the applicant has presented us the context for that. So we'll begin that just this discussion. Commissioner Holford Smith, would you start this one? Yes, thank you. Uh, I think the is yeah, yeah, stay back. <laughs> 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 Made to speak. Nothing's sinking the yes. <laughs> um, sinking the uh, the terrace into the roof is a is a really good solution uh, to create some outdoor space, um, which is mostly not visible in this in this location. Um, I think the 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 brick on the side walls is appropriate given the. So surrounding context and other locations where sidewalls have been have exposed brick. Um, and I think at the front, the, the only thing that seems like it might be visible from a distance is the fence at the rear. But I think given the context and the dark building that's behind it, it will probably disappear pretty well. Um, but I do agree with uh, testimony that the windows in the rear facade should remain as they are currently configured um, and not be expanded as they are proposing to keep the original configuration at the rear. Commissioner Ginsburg. Thank you. Commissioner Chen. I think we are all in agreement. Commissioner Latvi. Okay, so how's this distance? <laughs> I think I think it's pretty good. So I'm I'm in complete agreement about 
everything, including maintaining uh, the original window of the mix. Commissioner Master. I agree with everything that Commissioner Holford Smith said. And Commissioner Chu. Again, as well, I agree. Okay, great. So I think we have a consensus. Would you make the motion? Thanks. Should have the right one here. In the matter of LPC 2309371-169 Congress Street in the Cuddle Hill Dis Historic District. An, an Italianate style row house built circa 1850. The application is to modify, this, modify the sloped roof to create a terrace, install a trellis, and alter windows at the rear facade. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Cobble Hill Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features, that the removal of portions of the shallow sloped roof will only be minimally visible from public thoroughfare that the proposed sunken terrace and new wall with window and door assembly will be concealed by the existing cornice, that the trellis in between the upper deck and the canopy units will only be partially visible at a long distance and against the backdrop of a taller building, that the connected brick veneer at the exposed sides of the sunken terrace will be harmonious with the materiality and color palette of this building and adjacent buildings, and that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the Cobble Hill Historic District. However, I find that the proposed combination of openings at the top floor of the rear facade will eliminate the original pattern of openings evident at this building and others in the row, and therefore I recommend that the original openings at the top floor of the rear facade be maintained. Thank you. And Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu? Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Jefferson? Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Master? Aye. Commissioner Holfersmith? Aye. With seven in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, so that's approved with the modification. Uh, please continue to work with the staff as you think about your windows at your rear facade, and we'll move to the next item. And the next item is public meeting item number three, LPC 23-01451, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 1151, lot 55, 225 Prospect Place in the Prospect Heights Historic District. This is an Italian eight style row house built uh, circa 1872. The application is to modify an opening and replace windows. Uh, this was uh, last on an agenda on June 13th, 2023. It was read into the record, but it was not presented at that time and no testimony was taken. Uh, the staff will be giving the presentation after we open the hearing. And let's go ahead and open Commissioner Chen. Sorry. Make a motion to open the hearing. So Thank you. Commissioner Lundy, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The hearing is open. Good morning, Commissioners. James Rusiello, Preservation Staff. We're good? Okay. <laughs> All right, um, and um, joining us remotely is David Lipkin, the owner. Okay, we're good, okay. Uh, 225 uh, Prospect Place is a row house, and the application before you today is to remove the two inward opening uh, basement windows at the primary facade, to modify an opening by dropping the sill, and uh, to uh, install one, one over one double hung window in the modified opening and one casement window in the other opening. Uh, the tax photos that you see before you show the row of four, one of which 221 has had a similar alteration and you can see that in that detail here. Uh, th these are the elevations and staff is working with the details, but the, uh, the replacement windows will be wood. You can see that here, and they will be painted to uh, match the uh, remaining windows that are being replaced. Why not be both? Pardon? Why are they just doing one? Sorry, two two windows. Oh, because I figured out the elevation showed just one. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's uh, just the two basements here. See? Yeah. Oh. Just, yeah. 
Oh, okay. Sorry. Is that they're extending? They're extending one. Extending one. I'm sorry, they're extending one. They're replacing. Two. Right. So why are they extending only one? Oh, I'm sorry. There's a, this is the area for the access to the basement. So you're you're not seeing a staircase there. So the grade changes. So the grade is higher where there's a horizontal window. Then they have stairs that go down okay. to a lower level. And so that's where they will have the taller window. Hmm. All right. Any other questions? All right, let's see if we have any public testimony. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes uh, to? Yes, Before we move on, the owner would like right. to. Uh, Stephen. Yeah. Go ahead, Abby. Before we move on, the owner would like to speak, if that's okay. The owner would like to speak, if that's oh, okay. okay. Uh, good morning. How's everyone? Um, so our main goal in here is to just make the space a little, a little brighter and lighter and get more airflow. Um, that's why we sort of went with the one window. We would be amenable to do both. Um, honestly, we didn't originally even think to ask for it. Um, just speak a little lighter. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. It's difficult to do it. It's loud, though. Oh, uh, apologies. I may be having internet problems. I'm going to turn off my video to see if it's better. I was simply saying our goal was to increase light and airflow in the space, and we would be amenable to do both windows if um, if people think that would be a better choice. It might require making um, a small light well, though, uh, for the second window. And James, perhaps if you could. Yes, uh, I've spoken with David prior to this. I believe uh, the intention he was trying to say is that the, the lower the window allows uh, more light into the basement to an occupied area, and to lower the other still um, would require a light bulb, I believe. Is that what, correct, David? A light bulb. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. And we'd be yeah, amenable to doing both. We'd be willing to do it if we wanted to. Right. Okay. That's what I heard. He said he's willing to do both, but it would require digging out for a light bulb. And again, it's part of a room. Um, one of those rows has had a similar alteration with one window being lowered. Yes, Commissioner Lucky. Uh -huh. So, I, I, is that is the larger window actually visible, or is it hidden by like a uh, front? The, the upper portions of both windows are visible from the street, which is so the lower, so the extended window is not really visible. It's not really visible from the street, no. Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Right. Um, there's nobody in the audience who wishes to speak on this item. Steve, do we have any remote uh, participants? Uh, we have one registered remote participant, Mary Shuford. Just a moment. Mary Shuford, please uh, raise your hand in the Zoom and I will promote you to panelist. All right, I do not see Mary Shuford uh, among the list of uh, online attendees. Okay, uh, and, and that is the extent of our registered uh, Zoom testifiers. Okay, all right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, let's close the hearing and begin our discussion. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Commissioner Goldwell, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. This is a, a relatively modest proposal to lengthen uh, one window opening where the grade lowers in the area way um, is the lowered portion of the window is uh, partially concealed because it is below grade. Uh, they are proposing a wood window. I'm going to be working with the staff on the details. And as James presented, there is another building in the row that has one window lowered as well. So Commissioner Lutfi, would you like to start this one? Yeah, um, I think it's very appropriate. Um, number one, I'm always an advocate for getting, you know, su supportive of uh, trying to get more light into environments or build. <laughs> and um, oh, they can hear. Yeah, okay. Okay, so 
I, I said I'm supportive of uh, trying to get extra light into the building. It's not visible. And as you said, uh, Sarah, um, and it's, this condition exists in another building, so I can support it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Master. I agree. I think it's appropriate. Commissioner Chu. Appropriate. All right. Does everybody else agree with that? <laughs> All right. Commissioner Lefkowitz, would you make the motion? Ah, yes. I think that's a little bad. Boy. So in the matter of docket 23014512252525 Prospect Place, Prospect Heights Historic District, an Italian aid style row house built in, in uh, 1872, the application is to modify and opening and replace windows. I note that the building style scale materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Prospect Heights Historic District. I further note that the basement window at 221 Prospect Place within the same row was similarly altered prior to designation. I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features, that lowering the sill of one basement level window will be difficult to perceive from the sidewalk level due to its location partially below grade in the sunken areaway, that the new one over one double hung window and ironwork within the modified opening will match a similar altered basement window opening at another building in the same row, that the change in operation at the smaller basement level window from inward opening awning to inward opening casement will not be perceptible and that the work will not detract from the architectural or historic character of the Prospect Heights Historic District. Thank you and Commissioner Ginsburg, would you second that motion? So. Uh, not here. Stephen, would you be able to call the vote? Actually, I'll do it. All right, Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Master. <laughs> Uh, I. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Ludvig. Ludvig. Aye. Can you call my name? <laughs> oh, uh, Chair Carroll. Aye. <laughs> All right, with eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. <laughs> we'll move to the next item. All right, the next item is public meeting item number four, LPC 23-10485, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 504, lot 19, 202 Sixth Avenue in the Sullivan Thompson Historic District. Uh, these are two buildings altered circa 1960, and the application is to amend a previously approved proposal to modify a masonry opening construct a wall and canopy at the rear yard and install signage and lighting. Uh, this is a true public meeting item. Uh, so the staff will make the presentation after we open the proceedings. All right, Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Chu, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the proceedings are open. So the applicant may speak after uh, Michelle presents. Good uh, morning, Commissioners, Michelle Grinner, and the Federation staff. This application is to modify a previous approval in the interior opening, construct a wall and canopy at the rear yard, and install signage and lighting, which was heard at the public hearing of October 11, 2022. The entirety of the scope of work proposed at that time was approved by the Commission. However, the applicants have since returned with a revised design for a portion of the approved scope. Um, as a reminder for the commissioner, this site is comprised of a corner building, corner apartment building, a rear yard, and a smaller residential building. What was presented in 2022 was limited to the corner apartment building and the rear yard. And this, partic this particular part of the scope of work before you today concerns the rear yard of 202 Sixth Avenue, which is open to Prince Street. Um, here you can see the existing conditions consisting of a simple metal roll down security gate that has been in place since the time of designation. And you can also see the rest of the site, which is considered non contributing to the historic district. For additional background, there was a prior proposal at the property, also approved by the Commission in 2019, which included work at the adjacent building on Prince Street. Um, as well, this proposal uh, no longer is being pursued. 
Um, and here you can see what the commission reviewed and approved last fall. At the time, the applicants were proposing a new wall at the sidewalk clad in full size bricks to match the facade of the adjacent building at the side at the sidewalk um, with metal and glass infill and a retractable glass canopy above. For this reason, a section of the wall um, seen here was designed lower to accommodate modifications required for fire escape. Um, and this is the current proposal for the rear yard. The applicants have changed the design by removing the canopy, reducing the width of the door opening and adding an additional window opening as they are now proposing um, a dark, and they are now proposing, sorry, a dark met finished metal mesh storefront system instead of glazing. And since the canopy is no longer proposed at the rear yard, the notch in the wall is no longer required for the fire escape. Um, there's no change to the lighting and signage as um, the commission previously approved. Um, and so, as previously approved, the wall materials will match uh, the materials of the adjacent building and again are full size bricks rather than a thin brick veneer over a masonry bathroom. The applicants are here and they can explain the change to the proposal in a bit more detail. So the applicants may speak. Mr. Blazer, Mr. Lee, Mr. Son, would anyone like to add to the presentation? Uh, please let me know if you'd like me to change any of the slides. I'm promoting Tyler to panelist now. Tyler, if you can unmute yourself and state your name for the record, you may speak. Yes, uh, I'm Tyler Blazer with I Crave Design. I am an architect uh, and we are presenting just a modest change to the front wall. Uh, do you want me to elaborate or to keep elaborating or do I need to add anything you like? I mean, we understand that okay, this yeah. is, the commission has two prior approvals on this property Correct. and this is a third amendment. So you might want to talk about Correct. Uh, specifically the changes. Yeah. Yeah, so the main change is we wanted to keep the wall open for not only transparency and security purposes, but also to allow for a little bit more of a richer dynamic uh, material to the facade. So we were proposing um, this banker wire uh, woven, wire, woven architectural mesh in a weathered steel. Um, you can see in the previous slide where there's a couple of the images below. Um, so the, the pattern is the furthest one to the left. Uh, it's Bank Roar SJD2. And we would propose that in the weathered steel to match with the existing neighborhood context, um, such as the Soho Hotel, the Nomo Soho Hotel, and even across the street at Little Prince where they have a weathered steel uh, facade. So we think it would fit well with the neighborhood, doesn't stand out. The stainless steel is too bright. We thought we wanted to make it kind of blend in and match and be sympathetic to the existing conditions along Prince Street and provide a more inviting um, street presence along this area of, of the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Yeah, I didn't quite hear what the architect was saying about the stainless steel because the rendering looks dark and the stainless steel is very bright. He's so saying we, something about the finish. The color. The we color? Would, it was, it was yeah. too bright that oh. he wanted the dark finish. Oh, so that's just a sample to show the product, but it's, it's going to be a dark. If you go back to the um, okay. prior page, you yeah. see it, it's on the left. I believe it's on the left. Yes, yeah. the color. You know, a weathered steel. It's are on the very left. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So not, not, the, not the stainless steel. Yeah. This, this is just the pattern that we were the proposing. Pattern. Yes. Okay. And we would want that to be in the weathered steel finish, which is oh. in the, the third example image. There's a weathered steel um, finish that we think would be much more fitting for the area um, and, and fit well with the neighbor context. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Commissioner Lutfi. So is the um, is that mesh going to be just on the window or is it the window? Is it wherever there is glass? Okay, I just wanted to clarify. Okay. And it sits in front of the glass, correct? Yeah, but there won't be any glass. So it I see. It's, it's just open. Opens now, totally out of the door. Oh. No glass, just the mesh 
like a yes. gate, yeah. but deep yeah. held like a door. And then there's a window next to it, which is Same exit thing. from the restaurant inside that comes to an okay. end. That window is also to the rear yard. So this line here that you can see on the right, that's a yeah. hall. But there's an exit from the restaurant that goes in this landing and a stair that goes where that the window is. And that's outside, so there's no window. There's no glass there either. Correct. Okay. Good. Okay. All right, so, and as we've seen this, um, the commission approved in 2019, actually a combined um, storefront system over the building to the left and uh, covering this rear yard area. And then in 2022, 20, uh, that we saw a scaled back proposal for just a wall with storefronts leading to this garden space with a, a greenhouse roof. Um, which we approved as an amendment. And there, this is a further amendment, further scaling back the proposal. It'll no longer have the retractable skylight roof. Uh, so now it can have a straight parapet and um, the openings will be designed like infill uh, to relate to the commercial character of the street, but will actually be an open mesh, a darkened steel open mesh that will allow you to uh, see into the garden. So it's sort of a garden wall designed uh, to look like uh, the this, this storefronts along the street. One small question. Does that require panic hardware egress from the inside? Yes, we will be providing all necessary be cars behind that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All necessary uh, egress uh, hardware yeah. will be provided. Okay, thank you. Any final questions, commissioners? All right, let's begin our discussion. Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to start this one? See if this works. Um, yeah, I I think that um, I I don't particularly feel that this is a major kind of aesthetic contribution to a major aesthetically important building. Uh, it's peculiar in that it's kind of it looks like a regular kind of glass storefront infill, but it's really not. But that might be okay. I don't think you know. I, I think from a from a preservation perspective, there's nothing particularly objectionable about it, even if it's a bit peculiar. I do think that the issue um, that Commissioner Chu raised is important. Uh, if they're going to be using panic hardware on this thing, you do not want to see a, a cheapo tube on the back of this. They're going to have to use. They, they should. The applicant should work with staff to come up with a. Uh, a hardware uh, proposal. I mean, it's going to have to be the Blumcraft fancy mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, but, you know, they can get it to look more or less like this. Not exactly, but um, I, I I don't really object to it. I, I kind of feel that the placement of what I think is a blade sign is a bit peculiar also on the left. Is that a blade sign, that little conical thing? I mean, that was previously well, there, there's a light previously approved in the yeah. prior. Is that a light? It's one of those little yeah. black things that are below it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I don't know, it's a sky. It's a sky. Yeah. And then the little black ones are also no, it's a sign. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. So the blade sign, I, I would just say they should probably move it a little bit up. Okay. But, but I think that was previously approved. Out the door. Okay. Commissioner Ginsburg. Um, I, I, I think this is approvable. I agree with Commissioner Goldblum that they should work with staff to integrate a panic bar that looks elegant and, and doesn't detract from the design. All right. And just I'm going to ask if anyone else has any differing opinions. Although I actually yes, Commissioner Lafay. also think, I think it's a very interesting, uh, you know, it's a very interesting move, change. And, and I think overall, I, I agree with everything, but I also think it, that the applicant should work with staff just to make sure that this little fencing works well, because it's possible that if it's the openings are too tight, like it, it might not look that good. I feel like it needs to be a little uh, 
it, it needs to be open and airy enough to uh, to sort of so that it serves two purposes. There's like a, a good it. it it works with them from a secure for them with a, from a security perspective since that's what they're thinking about, but also visually, so that it doesn't look like it's a, a jail or a, you know just not aesthetically pleasing. <laughs> I think we can ask the staff to review samples in the field to just yeah. ensure the density allows enough transparency in the reading. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum, would you make a motion to approve this with the modification that they work with the staff uh, to integrate the hardware and to uh, review the density of the mesh in the field? Regarding 202 6th Avenue and Sullivan Thompson Historic District, the application is to um, amend a previously approved proposal to modify a masonry opening and construct a wall and canopy through a yard and install signage and lighting. I note that the building does not contribute to the special architectural or historic character of the Sullivan Thompson Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the proposed storefront facade will replace a deteriorated utilitarian roll-up security gate, thereby enhancing the streetscape at the configuration of the metal infill featuring a recessed entrance flanked by side lights and transoms with an adjacent opening uh, with a transom. We'll recall historic storefronts found in the historic district in a contemporary way that the proposed welded wire mesh with a dark finish will pro provide security in a transparent manner and will be evocative on a larger scale of metals window screens commonly found on windows and that the work will not detract from special architectural and historic character of this Sullivan Thompson historic district. The applicant will work with staff to um, look at the scale and design of the mesh and to refine and uh, define the uh, panic hardware. And Commissioner Lefty, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair sure, Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Lefty. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With eight in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. So that's approved. And please continue to work with the staff on those final details. And we'll move to the next item. All right. The next item is public meeting item number five, LPC 23 05732, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, Block 575, Lot 127. 56 West 12th Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. This is a Greek Revival style row house built in 1843. The application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions and an in-ground pool in the rear yard. This was last presented um, actually at the public hearing of May 2nd, 2023. No action was taken at that time. It was also on an agenda on June 13th, 2023, uh, but we were not able to uh, view it on that day. So this is a regular public meeting item and the applicant will be giving a remote presentation after we open the proceedings. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? Someone. Thank you, Commissioner Master. Would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the applicant may speak after the staff introduces it. Okay, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing. Michael, you now have control of the presentation. Um, you can advance the slides using your arrow keys, your mouse. Please state your name for the record and you may begin. Michael Haverland. Great, um, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for your comments at our last hearing on May 2nd. Uh, since our proposed facade restoration work and rooftop addition appear good as is, we focus today on the rear yard addition. Per your comments, you requested that we reevaluate the step back terraces, align the basement and second floors, first and second floors, and consider our proposed third story of the rear yard addition. Note that the pool we propose is now located in the center of the rear garden with a five foot planted area at each lot line as discussed. We included additional context photos that illustrate one, the scale of the rear yard additions in our row to the west and overall building mass, 
a three-story rear yard addition in our row at 64 West 12th, which you see in slide two in particular, and we label that in the other images as well. We also show uh, a few more photographs looking east to show the massing and the scale of the large additions in that direction. And we focus on, in, in image one on this slide, a recent LPC approved three-story rear yard addition across our rear yard as seen in this view from our top floor. And for reference, here's that proposal. Regarding the step back terraces and the first and second floors, we align these floors and decrease the footprint. The first floor facade is pushed back two foot one inches from our previous proposal. I'm just gonna flip ahead so you see the previous proposal from May 2nd for reference. We also propose a Juliet balcony on the, on the parlor floor of the second floor. Regarding the three-story height of the addiction, because of the multifamily use, it is important to maintain the floor plate dimensions in order to make a viable one bedroom simplex unit on the third floor. In this 3D rendering, we zoomed out a bit further than the last um, presentation to show all of 64 West 12th Street to the west with its three story addition and also the broader context, which I can indicate right there. Um, and also the broader context with deeper rear yard additions to the east. Detail is also added to this rendering, particularly the stair in our neighbor's garden to the west and its brick wall that both extend past our revised proposed location of the addition. Since several of you were comfortable with our previous design as is, and several more with the massing, we feel strongly that the three-story rear yard addition in this particular context and given our multi-use program is appropriate. For reference too, we just uh, show the plan, which uh, gives you the key dimensions um, regarding the, the, the current setback and relative to those other details. Um, thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? And, uh, Gregory, did we receive any additional written comments on this item? Sorry, I lost my sheet. Request. So we received additional comments from village preservation, but makes approval feeling that the height of the proposed rear yard addition should be reduced by one floor. So the two stop stories of the original rear facade are retained in intact row. And also we received additional comments from HTC and one additional individual. Okay. And as always, those letters were shared with the commissioners in advance. Okay. Um, so, commissioners, if there are no final uh, questions, we can move to our discussion. I think the last time we saw this, this was also a, a proposed as a three-story rear yard addition with multiple steps in it, and the commission asked them to simplify that, and uh, so the applicant is coming back, um, and they have simplified the plane at the lower two floors, um, and then the, retained the a, a setback third floor um, to try to relate to the context, which has some taller buildings, but also some two-story additions as well. And so um, we'll have our discussion on this one. And uh, right, Commissioner, I'm trying to think of who might have been here. <laughs> Commissioner Holtzman. <laughs> sure. I, I... Um, but um, I think the simplification of the rear facade is an improvement, but I still or I think I feel that the, the addition is too tall, that this should be reduced by one floor. Um, I think there's quite a strong context 
of the rear facades of the existing buildings and that the, the addition just it's it's just too it's too big kind of overwhelms the, the house okay. um i mean it, it it is as the applicant presented it's a multiple dwelling and so the third floor is important to get that um additional unit so i just wonder What's not really clear here is that the building at the other end of the row also is three stories. And if they were to set it back to align with that, would that be uh, more more acceptable to you? And that would that would allow better. a greater better reading of the two story portion. Yes, yeah. and then I'd like to hear what other commissioners have to say about it. But yeah, thanks. I mean, if they're making it, I I, I missed it. There's a, a, a unit every floor is a unit. I think so, yeah. but he did. I'm not sure about everything, but he did say that the third floor was a separate unit, and that was important to them. Okay, and Corey will check as we move on. Commissioner Goldblum, I have no uh, concerns. I think this is appropriate. Commissioner Ginsburg, I think it's really appropriate. Commissioner Chen, one question. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, I'm going to approve this. Okay, Commissioner Master. All right, Commissioner okay. Chu. Yes, the the revision um, approves the proposal and it's appropriate. Okay, all right. So I think we have enough to support it. Commissioner Ginsburg, would you make the motion? Well, let's see if I can do it without too much feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the matter of LPC 23057326 West 12th Street, Greenwich Village Historic District, a Greek Revival style row house built in 1843, Applica application is to construct rooftop and rear yard addition and an in ground pool in the rear yard. Uh, I note that the building style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. I recommend that the proposed, I, I find that the proposed work will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features, that the proposed work will not be visible from any public thoroughfare, that the rear yard facade of the neighboring row house, houses features a variety of additions, fenestration patterns, and changing planes, and therefore the proposed work at the rear yard of the building will not affect a unified row, that the design and materiality of the rear yard addition featuring brick cladding and steel casement windows and door assemblies and metal railings will be in keeping with the scaling character of the rear facades and additions within the block and will maintain the original top floor of the rear facade that the proposed rooftop addition features stucco cladding and steel casement windows and door assemblies will be set back from the front and rear facades, thereby retaining a sense of the building's original form and massing, and that the proposed excavation at the rear yard will be done in compliance with the Department of Building Regulations under the supervision of a licensed professional engineer to protect the buildings in adjacent building. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, okay. sorry. Sorry, I had to go to the next page here. The excavation will be limited in footprint and depth and will not impede upon the overall open character of the central green space. That a five foot wide unexcavated section of the rear yard will be retained at the rear of the site. And that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. Thank you. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Chu. Commissioner Ginsburg. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Master. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With seven in favor, none opposed, the motion passes. That's approved. And we'll now move. Thank you very much.
Wow, it's so nice to be here in person. Well, I wonder the air conditioning work. Oh, really? Hi, I'm Albert Cabos from the United American Land. And we're very, very proud and excited to present the first building coming out of the Soto Rizona, which is uh, 277 Canal Street. There'll be 100 residential units, of which is uh, 25 units will be affordable housing, which is really a much needed in this neighborhood of the neighborhood itself. Uh, by the way, the, the affordable housing will be administered by the Fifth Avenue Committee. The building is on the northeast corner of Canal Broadway. It's been owned by my family for over since 2001. And, no, well, hold on a second. Take my Oh, no, no. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So that's the book. Now, frankly, the book hasn't changed much since we came part of the Soho uh, uh, extension. It's not something really bad. But if you look at the building, I'm going to tell you to be honest, okay, my honest opinion. It doesn't scream or look like a Soho cast line building. This is a building that look, could look like, you know, on the Upper West Side and Broadway, or maybe even Midwood somewhere. It doesn't seem to be like the building part of the district. So that's why you think it's very, very appropriate that we can come up with some sort of addition that we're talking about. Furthermore, you know, I understand when you're dealing with the uh, commission, I was thinking about past that, right? And you say, well, if you approve this one, I want to know that you're going to have everybody in Soho calling you up to find out an addition. But if you look at the building, the localized three story building, it looks like it's it's screaming for an addition. I mean, look, look at it, it looks like it has a natural base. So, um, so in terms of precedent, I don't think you have to worry about precedent. So, so I just want a little background on my family and our business. Um, we, we based in our home for the past 35 years. My brothers and I were family business and we're really the uh, dinosaur. You know, we don't take any equity, we don't do Wall Street money, it's just our own family money. We do our business, it's very, very personal. We do. Massive there you go. So we're really involved in Soho. These are some of the projects we're involved in. Uh, 321, 323 Canal Street, it's a federal drive building, which we really you know, it's a really painful job actually, because the whole wall was taken down in front. And we saved all the original brick, original brick, went back up. We received a boosty most of the work for that on the corner of uh, Howard and Canal. And Mercer, we have a Mercery, 309 Canal Street, which is one of the park store that we restored. At 430 West Broadway, in the middle of the 50,000 square foot boutique office building that we also got approved by the commission. Um, we really believe it's for us to start preservation in our ethos. And of course, Makes the job a lot more difficult, but it makes it a lot more rewarding at the end of the day. And Brooklyn 503 Fulton Street is a designated landmark, 250,000 square feet. It will adapt and be used. 
uh, on the ground floor, we have uh, in most rooms rack, uh, H&M, uh, Old Navy, H&M Max, and we have 110 uh, residential units above. A 33 Union Square uh, is a landmark overlooking Union Square Park. It happened to be uh, Andy Warhol's factory where he got shot in that building. Uh, 55 Green Street, a lot of people must know that it was like a famous building that was undermined by the building to the south. So it was another painful job. It must have been like six years restoring this beautiful cast iron building. But we also wanted to lose even more of the work for that as well. Ah, so Canal Street. We have a very, very big interest in Canal Street. And we have an interest in seeing this particular site develop. During, let's talk about the history of Canal Street, right? We all remember that Canal Street is what you used to get in your um, hardware and plastic. It evolved. And it evolved in the 90s. The Asian community started coming in, the Chinese community started coming in, all the television selling, all knockoffs. There's a tremendous enforcement now that no longer knockoffs are being sold in the building. Now, all the knockoffs are being sold on the street, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's beside the point. So now, uh, Canal Street is evolving. So um, right before COVID and during COVID, we partnered up with a group called um, a Wall Play, where we activated all these vacant stores, storefronts on Canal Street for free. We just gave it for free to artists and pop-ups and galleries. And we just started started slowly changing. And as a, as a result of that, we just, we, you know, we have now some permanent uses. We have, you know, Drake's uh, uh, um, boutique. We have a couple of galleries. So we really feel like it's slowly, slowly changing and it's evolving. So this is, this is an amazing building designed by Mark. Um, I just want to point out uh, a couple of things. And when we were looking at this building, we started saying, ah, you know, it really, like I said before, it lends itself to be some sort of development of the site. So we started looking at it as well. We knocked down the building, we knocked down the building, and for a second, we said, absolutely, we have to preserve this building. That's what we do. So then, like I said before, you know, because you know, at the end of the day, it's a much more interesting building. And I think from a sustainability standpoint as well, it's it's more sustainable to save the building. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erin to talk about the history and then the then Mars. Thank you for your time. Yeah. You're going to have to lower the lake. And it's the mouse to advance. Okay. Um, good morning. Hi, Erin Rooley, Higgins Queens Park and Partners. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm going to take you through the um, history and context for why we think this proposal is appropriate. Um, and then Morris will share the, the details of the design with you. Um, so as you can see here, the proposal before you is for a nine-story plus penthouse addition. Um, and it's a rather straightforward approach that um, expands the building through a shared DNA. So the historic building is restored and establishes the base for this new composition. The, um, the, um, the physical fabric, the historic fabric or DNA of the existing building then establishes the, the materiality, the rhythm, and the expression of uh, everything above. And so the appropriateness has is rooted in a, a few fundamental issues. The um, building is unique in the historic district, and the site has a complex history of change that we think might provide an opportunity for, for future change on the site. The building is outside of the character defining um, phases of its development and of the district's development, but it nonetheless conveys a, a story of the district's evolution. And we believe that this um, addition really furthers that story of the evolving district. Uh, the expansion is also part of a, a model of commercial expansion that um, we see throughout the city historically, but most significantly along Broadway within the district. And then finally, the resulting composition um, is very much in keeping with the scale and height and, and character of the late 19th and early 20th century buildings that we see 
along Broadway um, in, in the district. So I think with that, we'll jump in. Oh, I went backwards. There, I think I'm going in the right direction. Um, so as uh, Albert said, the building is uh, located on the northeast corner of, of Canal and Broadway, three-story construction uh, dating to 1927 to 28 and designed by David Holtarsh. It was originally a mixed-use building. It had a very large theater, which was um, uh, entered at the far right, I think, pointer, I think. Say. Let's go. Um, at the uh, far eastern bay. So it had a, a large theater, retail on the ground floor, and then two floors of commercial above. And the, the building is located, of course, in the Soho Kassar District Extension, which was designated in 2010. And as you can see in the map, this really just picks up the east and west boundaries of the district that were not included in the main section of the, of the district in um, uh, that was designated in 1973. So um, the commission has, of course, seen projects like this in the past. This is not something new. Um, and so here are just three examples of projects that had additions um, uh, at the street wall or with minimal setbacks. And um, so we're looking at uh, uh, 50 Hudson in Tribeca, 70 Henry in um, Brooklyn Heights, and 250 Fifth Avenue that is part of the uh, Madison Square North District. Um, and while each of these has very different histories and contexts that built the appropriateness for the specific approvals, what they have in common is this compositional characteristic. So the, the, the interplay and the inspiration from the base, from the historic building for the new building, and then how those two parts interact and then how they interact within the broader context of the district height scale and um, facade articulation and we think uh 277 really fits within this um this context of, of well-designed very visible and um integrated additions so jumping into the history um there is a long history of significant change on the site um, here, starting with the earliest generation of buildings that we know of um, 1830s, view looking north on, on Broadway, uh, the federal period buildings on the, at, at the center of the view is that's the northeast corner of Canal Street. And so what you're seeing um, looking north along Broadway is that low um, line of buildings that originally existed um, in the district um, at that point. You're also seeing a little bit of the street life, the early street life of uh, the intersection of Canal and, and Broadway. <laughs> Um, by the 1860s, the, um, the earlier generation of buildings had been demolished and replaced with uh, a, a four-story Italianate store and loft building that we see on the right. Um, we also see that in the map. Um, and the um, uh, across the bottom is a streetscape view. So again, that evolving character of Broadway, we see a fairly consistent um, commercial evolution of the swing and loft buildings in the 1860s along Broadway. So the, the earlier federal buildings have given way to this um, store and loft uh, commercial evolution. The earlier building was then demolished in 1913 to make way for the subway. And you can see that curving line through the site. That's that's the subway. The subway is directly under this, um, this site. It's the spur of the, the BRT coming across the Manhattan Bridge and across Canal Street and its intersection with, with um, to the Broadway line. And that all happens directly under the site. So the building is demolished. And you can see on the uh, top left, there, you can see a small, there's a taxpayer and a couple of sheds developed on the site, um, but also the, the, the next generation of buildings that we're seeing rising on Broadway, the tall masonry buildings of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, so that, that shift again um, as, as time is passing. Um, and on the right is uh, the existing building. And so it isn't fully developed um, until 1927 uh, to 28. And we see that in the map also with the, the subway coming through the site. So um, as I mentioned, the building was originally designed by uh, David and Boltarsh. Boltarsh was a, an engineer, um, architect, 
contractor, developer, sort of jack of all trades. Um, and um, he, he usually worked in collaboration with another architect, including H. Craig Severance, uh, that we see in the top right, that is in the um, uh, uh, East Village Historic District and has a, um, an expansion that was included prior to, that uh, was added prior to designation. Um, and then we see a handful of, of uh, market buildings that were designed by Tarsh, including um, uh, 837 Washington Street, which I think we're all familiar with. Um, so Oltarsh designed the original market building, two-story market building in 1938. And then um, Morris uh, designed an addition that was approved by the commission in, in 2011. So we've seen this um, collaboration over time once before. Um, and uh, and I think that the really interesting thing about 837 is that um, it's very specific to its district context. So this edition is very different than what we're proposing today, but it's because it's so responsive to its to its context and the history, um, and and that's the inspiration for the uh, proposal today. So then just jumping back to the building, here's an early view of the building in the late 1920s, um, showing that vibrant um, retail and, and theater life in front of the building, um, major signage. It was the major theater originally. Um, so marquee, um, tall vertical brackets of um, blade sign and um, uh, retail along canal. Uh, there's also an image of the uh, original interior of the theater, which is no longer extant. So um, we've seen the evolution of the site and um, um, how that evolved over time, and um, but that corresponds to the broader evolution that we see throughout the district. And so stepping back to just to look at the, the district as a whole and how 277 fits into that. Um, the district is characterized by three primary phases of development, um, and we're seeing sort of uh, 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 the thumbnails for, for each one of those here. So it starts in the, the early to mid 19th century with um, the uh, residential development of uh, federal period, Greek revival, Italian aid uh, row houses. And uh, these are primarily two and a half to four stories in height. They were later converted for commercial use, sometimes expanded, um, but in general, this is that sort of earliest layer of, of physical fabric that we have in the historic district. Um, that gives way to the mid 19th and late 20th century store and loft buildings. So primarily five and six stories in height, uh, masonry and cast iron, of course, it's the, the namesake for the Soho cast iron district. Um, and then subsequently, the uh, late 19th and early 20th century tall masonry buildings that um, we see primarily along um, Broadway, and these are uh, in the range of nine to, nine to 12 stories. And so each one of these phases follows a, an identifiable pattern. There's a, a, a specific height and expression to each one of these buildings, these building generations. And um, there's an internal consistency within each of the phases themselves. And this is very distinct from what's happening at, at 277 Canal. So following that last phase of, of um, development in the district, we um, there's a period of decline. And so not much is built at that time. And um, But what is happening is um, major infrastructure and transportation improvements. And it happens primarily along Houston Street and also at, at Canal. But this is when our site is cleared and the, the subway is opened. So the designation report notes that the building, you can all read along here, but um, that the building is evocative of the changes taking place in the district related to um, uh, transportation and changes in mass entertainment. There's only one other um, entry in the designation report that has a comparable description, and that is uh, 270 Lafayette, which we see on the right, and that's a 15-story commercial building, Art Deco, um, and constructed in 1925. And so I think what we're seeing here is that these late commercial buildings aren't defined by a specific height or style in the way that the earlier buildings were. And this is very much um, a, a, a distinct condition from those early character defining phases. 
So um, in trying to understand how the addition might work um, for the building, we um, looked at comparable low-rise commercial buildings and how they evolved over time. And um, so we see this um, pattern of expansion um, throughout the city. And here are just a few few examples, but um, it's there's a broad it affects a broad range of periods and at varying scales. So it's not inherent in any one kind of commercial building. Um, so we have a 55 Wall Street, which I think we're all familiar with, where it essentially doubled the original 1840s building uh, by McKinley and White in the in the early 20th century. And and this is true of all of these examples we'll look at. There's subtle distinctions between the, the base building, the original building, and how it's expanded. And in the case of 55 Wall, that was through fenestration and um, um, articulation of the window openings, and also in the distinction between the columns, um, that there's a different order at the base of the building than there is at the top. So just these subtle um, interpretations that take place as a way of connecting but distinguishing between the two parts. Um, also, the um, Building at 17 John, originally constructed as a two-story taxpayer that received a, a later 13-story addition, and then the General Motors building, which was a full block um, colonnade building, building that received a 23-story addition um, by Street uh, Lamb and Harmon. So um, moving back to the district, we see this kind of evolution um, in the historic district along Broadway. Um, and we have two examples. Um, first, 525 Broadway, which is located at Spring Street. It starts its life as a one-story bank building and receives a later seven-story addition. And so that um, the original bank building forms the base of the new composition. Um, uh, arched ground floor with the transitional, there's a transitional floor articulated slightly differently than um, uh, what's happening above to distinguish between the base and the shaft, and then crowned by a, a two-story, a double-height attic story that carries up the, the arched vocabulary from the ground floor. And we see it again, we're locked to the north at 565 Broadway. This is at Prince Street, um, originally a, a five-story Italianate store and loft building um, executed in Tuckahoe marble. So it gets a four-story vertical extension um, by the 1890s. That's articulated in brick. You can see there's a, a subtle change. There's a change in the lintels um, on the upper story of the building. The cornice had been stripped back of the main of the original construction and then uh, crowned by an attic story. And so here we're seeing it again, the, the subtle changes in, in materiality or, or detailing that, that distinguish between the two parts. Um, and here we see our proposed addition within the context of those tall um, masonry buildings, the late 19th and early 20th century buildings on Broadway. Only those tall buildings are, are highlighted. I think we, we stuck to 120 feet and above, just to give you a sense of that context. And um, so what you can see with our street wall, we're at 148 feet, and it's um, sort of in the middle of that, that range of um, tall buildings, and it's at least 20 feet shorter than the, um, the tallest of the historic buildings. <laughs> okay, so um, we um, we sort of dissected this a bit, trying to understand what these buildings look like from a compositional perspective. And so here are two examples that, um, just to give you a sense of how that analysis played out, it, all of the buildings have um, a... Uh, uh, consistent expression. So there are a few characteristics that weave all of these things together, all of these buildings together. Uh, the tripartite composition, base, shaft, and capital. Uh, the use of major and minor cornices to mediate the, the vertical and um, horizontal um, 
expression of the building, and then variation in the fenestration, so the grouping and articulation of the windows. And so here, 599 Broadway, a 12 story street wall, two story base. There's that transitional floor at the third floor that um, uh, mediates between the, the shaft and the, and the base. Um, and that's articulated by just a, a, a subtle change in the, the window surrounds. And then uh, the crown double story and differentiated from what's below by, um, by a pair of cornices. And then 443 Roof Street. So similarly, a 12-story street wall, two-story base, transitional floor. Um, the shaft this is um, differentiated from the crown above. It has a um, extremely um, dense ornamentation um, at the at the crown of the building, um, but that two-story attic story and then a robust cornice. And so all of this sort of played into how we we thought about the addition compositionally. And I think. With that, Morris is going to share with you the design. Yeah, the back button. Thank you for um, it's official. We're back, and it's afternoon. It's a good afternoon. Um, thank you, commissioners, Chair Carroll, um, staff. Um, I'm usually nervous, but I'm particularly nervous today. But um, hopefully, um, after um, introduction by Aaron and Albert. I can take you through this. Um, before, <laughs> uh, let's see. There we go. Um, uh, also, I want to thank Aaron and Sarah from Higgins and Blades Forth because we have a long relationship working with uh, Higgins and Blades Forth, but their input and research really helped um, improve this design. And now we're pushing us to do a volume building. So um, we we looked at this building and we we feel like it is atypical of the district, as I mentioned, and it's a unique opportunity to do this for a public lodging. Um, we were inspired by 525 Broadway, particularly, um, and I can get talk about that specifically. And then also the other compositional studies that we did to understand how some of the only masonry buildings in the district were organized. Um, yeah, okay. So um, in, in a similar fashion to 525, we introduced an intermediate floor here as a transition between the existing building. We also introduced the new piece of terracotta that matches what's there, which I'll show you in detail in the details. Um, framed uh, the pilasters in a similar way the frame pilasters were framed on the existing building and then created a strong ground or, uh, at the top of the building in terracotta. The building is uh, rendered in brick uh, with the complementary terracotta material. Um, the materials are on the table uh, that we selected um, with a bronze tone um, uh, aluminum for the uh, windows and the lintels, uh, and a uh, zinc coated aluminum for the uh, mechanical overlay. There we go. Um, and we did a similar, uh, obviously, organization on Canal Street elevation. So the rhythm of the blasters comes from the base of the building. Uh, we have some little Easter eggs like the um diamond lights on the tip of them uh in the existing building were used to inspire that sawtooth pattern on the brick you can see on the pilaster and that was something similar that we did at 837 washington on um, the other old touch building uh where we used the striped striped brick uh to form the brick pattern um on the vertical tower and behind that um Aaron will pick up at the end and talk a little bit about the restoration work and storefronts, um, but I can answer any questions after that as well. Uh, here's a rendering of the building. Uh, I'll show you a series of streetscapes, um, and then we'll get into the details. So again, a primarily brick facade, which is a complementary color to the existing brick, which has more of a blend and a range of a more monochromatic 
um, but complementary color and also um, uh, similar light uh, of window organization. However, the windows on the base uh, are, uh, have a slightly larger percentage of panel, um, which is what we did also uh, for the store fronts. Um, working um, from the top of the building, you see the terracotta, the shaped terracotta, uh, which will have a slightly higher sheen of the terracotta there, but the color will be uh, similar to the brick. And we selected that um, as a complementary color rather than a contrasting color that you see on the terracotta at the base, because we wanted the building to complement the base and the base, the details of the base to stand out um, for the, the, the way they were originally. Um, and then uh, the brick pattern that you see um, on the blasters uh, with the framed element on the sides and terracotta, uh, uh, we call it a capital, but a frame uh, or head and base um, here and the same. Um, here's the material palette which you have on the table, as well as photographs of what we think the uh, what we know the base materials are but what they'll look like cleaned up um, both the terracotta uh, which has paint and needs a lot of attention will either be replaced or repaired um, and then granite for the base and the burnt uh, cleaned up and pointed. I just wanted to the three projects that we worked on. Windermere on the left, which has a similar brick pattern. You can see on the lower uh, image there. Um, and then two buildings that we did, one um, on 2nd Avenue and 7th Street, uh, which uses a series of different brick patterns to articulate the base, middle, and shaft of the building. But also wanted to point out the, the depth of that side, which is similar to what we're proposing. Actually, we see that in some areas. But just to show how light and shadow are used to distinguish the side and make the building feel more comfortable uh, with the surrounding buildings. Uh, and then uh, another uh, building uh, on Grand and Mulberry, uh, which has a similar um, uh, use of decorative brick to in a use in a different way to start taking the, the detail of that on the side. Sorry. Um, here's an enlarged view of the crown, also um, showing the the, um, the terracotta material, the brick, the detail at the uh, mid the, the shaft of the building with the head um, uh, at the top of those pilasters and the uh, lentils. There is about, and I apologize, the dimensions aren't in the set, but I have um, a dimension drawing that you can spare if you like. Uh, the, the columns are uh, 12 inches deep. Uh, total uh, 10 inches from the glass to the edge of the brick uh, blaster. Um, and then the um, flanges on the uh, lintels are seven, six inches uh, for the, for the at floor line and three inches uh, between the windows. That's the depth of this flanging. Um, and then you notice the um, mechanical screen, which is not visible from immediately below the building, but we have the other views that you can see from around the neighborhood, which I'll show you now. Um, and then uh, here's a detail uh, showing the dimensions uh, of the um, center section of the building. And this is the drawing, I have these three drawings with the depths. Uh, this is showing the penthouse, which is set back about a little less than 12 feet from the canal, and it's just over 20 feet. Uh, from Broadway, uh, but we meant to show that, like the, the additions that you see, or the stairs or rooftop accretions that you see from the neighborhood. And I'll show you those in the views. And then here you get a sense of the um, penthouse with the mechanical screen, and then um, all the mechanical equipment set back. But you can see that, the, that there is a, a light well behind on the northeast corner of the building. And then just showing some of those details uh, that we pulled um, from the existing building. So the framed um, blasters, uh, which we uh, did some similar treatment around, uh, 
we need the diamond shape uh, lights, um, and then the corners, which is why I the shapes of the corners, uh, the corners elements, the top of the buildings. And then the streetscapes. Um, I just want to note two things. One, um, we have we designed a building on the corner, on the uh, northwest corner, uh, which uh, so I'll show you is here. Uh, that uh, staff asked us to uh, remove that from these um, images, but we also have the images with that building rendered at the, in the appendix of the material. Yes. Yes. And it's not built. And Absolutely. when it is built, it would block about two thirds of that view, right? Yes. And and the, the, the same view with the building is in the appendix. I mean, I can show it to you. Um, and then, yeah, from here you get a sense of uh, the rooftop, uh, the penthouse, as well as the mechanical screen, which uh, is in a zinc uh, coated aluminum, which sort of blends with the sky. Um, and then uh, here's a view looking west on the canal. Again, this is that uh, penthouse that you see uh, that looks uh, similar to a lot of the stair bulkheads and equipment. Uh, uh, over on the east throughout the district. And then this is uh, looking south, excuse me, south, and then the same treatment for that. And uh, and you get the sense of this. You'll see it in the elevation streetscapes, but that, that building is more or less in scale with the with taller buildings that you see on corners uh, along the Uh, we were asked to provide two views and you can see there's a key uh, here. Uh, the first view, you don't see the building. This is uh, looking south on Crosby. You can't see the, the building, uh, which is actually not shown here, I should say. Um, and then on the set, in the second view, you can see uh, just over this building and we uh, rendered that. Let's get a glimpse of that. Two views, one looking south on the left and one looking right into Google Earth views just to show uh, the building um, in context. As you see here, across the one less line. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, dancing, right. it's dancing around. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, there it is. Okay, so here we have a series of, um, of uh, elevation streetscapes uh, at the top, uh, the existing uh, building, and then the proposed building. Uh, this one streetscape does show 419, which is the building I just said we removed. It's in this uh, rendered, though. Um, and then uh, this is the key of just a few of the blocks on uh, Broadway. Uh, again, that's the existing building, uh, and then the proposed building, which more or less is in line. And we have a, a, a wider view as well, uh, which you see here. Again, uh, on the top uh, is, and the right corner is 277, where you see that, and more or less in line with those taller buildings. This is the east side of it. Or maybe salvation of the west side. Um, and I'll turn it over to Aaron to do uh, her Thank you. Great. So it seems like the appropriate place to sort of end is, is on the building itself. Um, so let's just say that. Um, Looking there. Yeah. So um, here we just see the um, the existing building uh, as it uh, exists today. Um, there have been a number of changes, primarily to the base of the building, um, where the piers have been um, obscured over time or even removed. Um, and so there's been generations and generations of change um, uh, at the storefront level. 
um, the existing windows have um, are non-historic, and there's a um, collection of signage that has just sort of um, evolved over time with the building itself. Um, and we'll take a look at some of the details. Um, as Morris mentioned, the, the all of the terracotta on the building, so the building is primarily terracotta um, and this um, blend of brick, um, granite water tables at the, at the piers. Um, all of the terracotta has been coated, so that will be restored um, where it, it's um, restorable and uh, replicated in kind where, where necessary. Um, the capitals are missing on many of the, the piers, pilasters, um, that'll be replicated. There's some uh, displacement of the masonry. Um, it's had a couple of um, rather unsympathetic repointing campaigns. So there'll be a full scope of, of restoration to the um, uh, terracotta and brick masonry. Um, on the bottom right is the um, what was the original st structure for the marquee, so the theater marquee, and it's been clad over, and so that will be um, uh, reclad and um, used as the residential entry for the building. Uh, here we just get a set of detail. This is a, actually a good shot that shows you the terracotta up at the top of the building. You can see where it's been coated versus not and, and where it's been repaired. Um, but also uh, the stretch banners, um, the non historic windows. Um, so all of that gets um, sort of addressed as part of the, um, the, the restoration. Um, on Broadway, there is an, a subway entry within the building, and we see that on the right. Um, but this also gives you a good idea of what's happened to the terracotta piers. Um, they've been clad over, cut back, parged. Um, and so this is a sort of huge undertaking is to reestablish that, that rhythm along the, at the pedestrian level of the building. So here is the, the scope of work. And so the, the intent here is to bring back the, the expression of the historic building and um, the rhythm of the bays at the ground floor. So restoring um, all of the piers with um, terracotta, um, all new uh, infill. We don't have very good documentation for what existed historically in terms of the storefronts. They changed within the first 10 years, it appears. Um, and then there was a lot of sort of um, open configuration. And so we've gone with a um, uh, contemporary infill that we think is um, provides a, a lot of flexibility within the um, within the restored masonry base. Um, the, the configuration of the storefronts is derived from the tripartite windows on the upper floor. So we get that sort of wide center bay, wide center uh, window or uh, paired entry, and then side lights. Um, at the marquee, the marquee will be reclad. It's the res new residential entry. We have um, the uh, windows will match the historic configuration. They'll be executed in aluminum rather than wood. Um, and there's a panel detail. We're going to see that um, the slabs are being adjusted slightly to provide a, a greater um, clearance at the ground floor uh, for contemporary retail. So um, the slabs um, are covered by a, a, a small panel at the bottom of the windows. We'll look at that in detail. There's the, the new uh, cornice or coping stone at the very top of the building. I wish I could point to it. The, um, uh, right now, it's just a simple coping stone, but we thought it needed a sort of more prominent termination to the building. So that's there. And there's also a modification to the urns that you see at the um, easternmost bay. Um, and we'll, we'll look at that in detail. There. Um, the storefronts are being um, uh, uh, configured as a master plan just to provide flexibility in the future because we don't know what the retail needs will be. So we've, we've looked at two possible schemes, one with two retailers, larger footprints, um, one with four. Um, the proposal is for um, flexibility in terms of infill, whether it's a display window or a pair of doors. Um, the signage package would include um, three types of signage, uh, a bracket sign that's attached at the storefronts, um, Internally illuminated signs at the at the sign van um, and uh, uh, decal or painted signage on the glazing. You see those here. A uh, proposal would be there's a note here um, about the, the frequency of the signage, but the signage is proposed in every day. The um, the the sign van signs. 
And just so you can see this in a bit more detail, the um, the internally illuminated signs would be two feet in height, um, and they would occupy the the open freeze area um, at the at the cornice, the storefront cornice. The, and um, so it wouldn't interfere at all with the, the reading of the cornice. Um, and it'll be, they'll see, be seated on a, a ledge attached to the, the new storefront end bill. Uh, similarly, with the bracket sign, it'll project from the, the new infill, not the masonry here. Um, there's also an error here. Um, we have a 12 inch maximum projection on the drawing, but it's actually 18. Um, and then, so I think on the right, we see some of the historic photos, how signage has evolved on the building over time. Of course, it was a theater, so it had massive lit signage um, on uh, the, the theater entry as well as the um, as, as well as the marquee and then we just see a sort of collection of signs that evolved over time at the storefront level. Um, this was the early uh, home of Pearl River Mart, I think most people are familiar with it. Um, and as you can see this 1980s photograph, it really shows you the um, the uh, extent of signage, the character of it. Um, and I think this is a sort of really good place to talk about um, the character of Canal Street. It is a, a, a vibrant, active place. It is a um, major interborough, interstate thoroughfare. <laughs> and um, it with two-way traffic, subway entries, and, and people everywhere. And so this plan is really meant to uh, provide a, a sort of organized approach to the signage and storefronts, but maintain its visibility. It's it's a very different place than Mercer Street or other parts of the district. Um, and it's at times, historically, the building has been overwhelmed by its signage and, and, and retail presence. And so there's a, a uh, an intent here to really just be able to address it in, a, in an organized way and maintain some of that visibility. In a very uncertain retail world. <laughs> Albert would like me to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we've worked together a lot of times. Uh -huh. um, the, um, um, uh, at the windows, I mentioned that the slabs are being slightly reconfigured. There's about a three a three foot change between, from slab to slab um, within the historic um, volume, and so it um, creates a, a sort of panel condition at the base of the windows. But when we look at the historic photo, which we see on the bottom left, um, you can see there's a rather thick rail bottom rail to the window or sill, and so um, we looked at this in perspective to understand sort of what the what the delta might be, and we think that it comes actually fairly close to what the historic condition is. And I think when we look at it in um, elevation, it tends to overrepresent what the perceived change might be. And so we hear we're here at the elevation. So again, the the sort of three part storefront configuration with the signage package, the mark marquee, the new marquee, um, restored window configuration on the second and third floors, um, that parapet, the, the cornice at the top of the parapet, and then the urns. So at the at the pavilion, at the sort of easternmost bay, the corners are marked with um, uh, three-dimensional urns. Uh, they're terracotta. And the proposal here is to either modify them or replicate them so that they're then engaged. There's a brick pier behind it. And so the urns would be engaged with the brick pier, uh, but still maintain that reading and um, the, the sort of presence of that bay in the in the composition. So here, um, the uh, there's a subway entry. It's the the center bay on Broadway, and this is um, the pedestrian entry down to the um, uh, the end. And um, we looked at this entry as part of the existing conditions. But the proposal here is to really um, uh, uh, rehabilitate the subway entry, maintain the storefront. There's currently a storefront. Um, that looks out into the subway. You see that on the left there, um, and um, maintain that to the the north retail space, and then use the other two walls as um, an opportunity for public art installation. And I think that this sort of brings um, 
together all of those things that Albert was talking about there, um, uh, United American Lands uh, efforts on Canal Street, the, the, the galleries bringing art to Canal um, with the pop-ups and, um, and then drawing on that long history of art artist use and preservation of, of Soho. So sort of bringing it all together in the spot at the, at the subway entry. And with that, that's it. Um, and we look forward to hearing your questions and Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very thoughtful, clear presentation. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Sure. Yes, Commissioner Ginsburg. Okay, hopefully, I have a few questions. Thank you. Um, I'm presuming features to uh, make it as energy efficient as possible. Yes. Um, I believe there was a question about having some gas for a potential restaurant, um, but it's an all electric. Thank yeah. And then finally, because this is a new requirement that I just started having to deal with, the MTA requires that any building within 60 feet of a subway station you have to make an application if they want to, in effect, take space for an elevator. This is tied to that. Have you talked to the MPA about that? Do you will not need that? Because I wouldn't want them to come. You didn't have to come back to us with having to change it because of what they want. That was an issue that came up at the community board. Um, and we have not talked to the MTA yet, but we anticipate having to talk to them primarily because it's below the building. Right. And we've done that on other projects in historic sort of districts where we work with them. But um, that was an issue that came up. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Uh, thanks. Uh, so is the penthouse level a uh, zoning requirement in terms of setbacks, or was that just a choice in terms of context? We're at the more or less maximum street wall, and so it is a requirement. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Um, we're going to move to testimony, but before we do that, we're just going to do one uh, quick housekeeping item that we uh, when we read this item into the record it somehow the audio didn't work so we're just going to read it in again uh, so that it's on the record so i'll turn it over to corey harala to read the item in all right thanks uh so again this is public hearing item number one lpc 23-09351 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the burnt manhattan block 209 lot one 277 Canal Street, AKA 277 to 289 Canal Street and 418 to 422 Broadway in the Soho Cast Iron Historic Districts Extension, a Renaissance Revival Style Theater Store and Loft Building designed by David M. Altarshan, built 1927 to 28. And again, the application is to construct a vertical enlargement and establish a master plan governing the future installation of storefront infill and signage. All right, thank you very much. So we're going to start with people who are present and who have signed up to speak today, and then we'll move to remote participants who wish to testify uh, via Zoom. So we're going to start with our signed up sheets, and we have uh, Borough President Mark Levine. Okay. All right, so we'll move to Lucy Levine. Hi, commissioners. My name is Mr. Levine. I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HTC finally finds the building's bulk of height to be inappropriate and out of scale with its neighbors. We believe that the project's aesthetic and its approach to the existing three story building are quite good, and we can imagine that a scheme that is four stories shorter would be something we would find appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Sanders. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Aaron Sanders, and I'm the public policy director at the Association for a Better New York. Thank you for the opportunity to submit comments on behalf of ADNI in support of United American Lands application to secure a certificate of appropriateness. ADNI is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing and supporting New York City's people, businesses, and communities. 
We're a 52 year old civic organization representing community stakeholders, including corporations, nonprofits, unions, government authorities, and edu educational and cultural institutions. The combination of the restoration of the existing building and the treatment of the new addition will anchor this important corner that serves as a gateway to the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. The project team is working to preserve and restore the facade of the existing building and use complementary and appropriate materials such as textured brick, terracotta, and metal on the upper story facade, which will ensure that the building fits into the context of the historic district. Restoration will improve the current conditions of the building. For example, the existing windows are not historic aluminum and do not match the historic configuration. The scale and design of the additions are keeping within the context of the masonry buildings along Broadway and the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. Further, as New York City continues to struggle with the burgeoning housing crisis, United American Land's proposal to develop affordable housing, particularly in a transit rich area and with appropriate contextual design should serve as a good example for future development. 277 Canal will be the first affordable housing development in one of the city's wealthiest neighborhoods since the city approved the Soho NoHo rezoning. This project will offer affordable new homes with preference to applicants who are visually impaired, blind, or hard of hearing, as well as for current residents who live within Manhattan Community District 2. The building would include a total of 100 units, of which 25% will be dis distinguished as affordable units. Other 100 units, 21 will be studio apartments, 44 will be one bedroom, and 35 will be two bedrooms. This project will welcome income diversity in the neighborhood while maintaining its integrity of the historic district. In conclusion, we support United American Land's application to secure a certificate of appropriateness, and we urge the commission to move forward with this approval of necessary and timely project. Thank you for your consideration. Great, thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else in the room who would like to testify on this item? All right, please come up one at a time and state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Adam Rodheim. I'm very excited to be at my first in-person LPC meeting and also my first meeting as a graduate of a historic preservation program. Uh, I want to speak quickly in favor of this project. Um, this is the first building since the city decided to allow increased densities in Soho, and I'm really excited by this project. I want to bring one piece of evidence that as historic preservationists, we often don't think about. Um, I did some quick calculations in ArcGIS this morning, and between 2010 and 2022, this historic district added only 11 net new apartments. Um, this building would dramatically shift that narrative in the midst of the housing crisis by adding 100 new units, um, and I think that's really important. Uh, to return to the building, uh, the materials rates are refined and the bulking is appropriate for the site. I think it will lovingly introduce and mark the entrance to the canyon of Broadway and will nicely fit with the rest of the historic district. Uh, if I were to express my one qualm, um, I think the signage plan signage plan is a bit bland um, for the site. Uh, it's had a really exciting history as a theater, um, and we could maybe be more dramatic. Um, so in sum, I urge the commission to keep the height and bulking of this building. Uh, it will be a great chapter uh, in the development, not just of the site, um, but so as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Yep, you can come up also and just, again, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, thank you so much. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, my name is Andrew Stern. I am a resident of CD2, and I would like to speak in favor of the project. Um, I believe the design presented by Morris Ajmi is coherent with the historical character of the neighborhood. Uh, but more broadly, I would like to appeal to the neighborhood's historical cultural character, from its industrial roots to the artistic renaissance that took root in Soho. The artistic movements that define Soho's history and culture could never happen in the neighborhood today. Soho has added an extremely minimal number of units, as Adam has pointed out, under 12 in the past uh, decade, leading to its current state, a neighborhood exclusively for the rich and occasionally the rent controlled. With five figure rents common throughout the neighborhood, the artists who created these buildings could never afford to live here today, to say the least. The project at 277 Canal, of course, cannot reverse this or provide enough housing to reverse this entirely. However, this project is an important first step in adding new housing and new affordable housing to a great but prohibitively unaffordable neighborhood. Um, it is vital that if changes are made, they do not compromise the 100 units of this building, including 25 affordable. This is an important precedent to set for the historic district. 
I hope that LVC will follow CB2's unanimous recommendation for approval, and thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. All right, Madam President Mark Levine. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate this chance to testify in support of the application by UIL at 277 Canal Street. As you said, I am Mark Levine, Manhattan Borough President. This project is very important. First, because it's the first under the framework established by the 2021 Soho NoHo rezoning in a neighborhood that desperately needs more housing and more affordable housing in a borough and a city that also desperately needs those things. Good urban planning says you want density on top of transit hubs, and this site is literally on top of a subway station. I'm using the word literally accurately in this instance. And in fact, the, the project would offer some improvements to the station, uh, including new public artwork there. Uh, the project would not only preserve the commercial podium, but actually would enhance it uh, with rehabilitation and repair of historic elements, including brick masonry, terracotta ornaments, piers, and installation of aluminum windows consistent with the original configuration, among other benefits. I also want to say that UAL has a lot of relevant history here, showing that it knows how to work on projects which have this kind of delicate balance. They have done historically, uh, they've done projects in, in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District already, uh, two mixed use projects at 321 and 323 Canal Street, and also at 53 Howard Street, AKA 301 Canal Street. They've also done a boutique office building at 430 West Broadway. Finally, uh, I wanna note that Community Board 2 has approved this and they did have some conditions. And I will say that I hope that in addition to approving this certificate of appropriateness for enlargement that you'll also um, make recommendations consistent with what CB2 has called for on height on the signage, which is specifically uh, to allow only halo illumination uh, and also to reduce the height of that signage. So um, uh, I look forward to this project becoming a reality and I thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. All right, is there anyone else in the room who would like to testify on this item? All right, we'll move to our remote participants and I'll turn it over to Stephen to take us through our remote participants. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we have a variety of uh, participants online via Zoom. Our first speaker will be Andrea Goldwyn, uh, followed by Jesse Lang. Andrea Goldwyn, I will be promoting you to speaker. Uh, please unmute yourself and state your name for the record. You all have three minutes to provide your testimony. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, good day, Chair Carroll and Commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Looking back, the Conservancy did not support the Soho NoHo rezoning because of concerns that it would encourage the demolition of smaller historic buildings and facilitate new, taller, bulkier construction that would disrupt the scale of these historic districts. Therefore, we're pleased to say that this proposal, one of the first under the new zoning, has taken great strides to respect the context of Soho's streetscape. Although the new building will be taller than most in the vicinity, this corner site is at the intersection of two major streets at the edge of the district where it will not overwhelm the low-scale cast iron structures that define Soho. The fenestration and massing of the upper floors have historic proportions that are contextual with nearby buildings, and the materials reflect the existing historic structure. That being said, we do believe that the design can be improved to make it an even better neighbor. As this is a corner building, it seems likely that the penthouse will have some visibility, but the refined detailing found at the facade does not extend to its design, which now comes off as an afterthought. We hope that more articulation can be added to the penthouse so it will appear integrated with the rest of the building. We have concerns about the bronze toned aluminum spandrel panels. Um, we've seen similar panels turn out poorly on other buildings and have concerns that they would have an artificial, almost pasted on quality here. 
we suggest switching the spandrel material from aluminum to terracotta or making sure that the design details of the spandrels are carefully thought out and reviewed with LPC staff. Regarding the storefront and signage master plan, the amount of signage seems excessive and the illuminated acrylic lettering does not appear to be appropriate for a building in the district. The storefront infill would benefit from larger glazed transoms rather than the proposed band of louvers and a higher bulkhead that would recall storefronts shown in the historic photographs. The Soho Cast Iron Historic District is a remarkable resource that attracts businesses, residents, and tourists like few others in New York or maybe the world. Any changes must be undertaken with great care. We believe that with some modifications, the proposed building will be an appropriate addition to the neighborhood. Thank you for the opportunity to share the Conservancy's views. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Jesse Lang, uh, followed by Robin Stantler, uh, Standifer. Jesse Lang, I will be promoting you to panelist, after which uh, we ask you to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes for your testimony. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity to testify today, commissioners. And um, I, my name is Jesse, and I am here speaking in support of this um, application on behalf of Open New York as a member and board member of the organization. Um, I. Uh, have was a supporter of the Soho NoHo rezoning, and I'm so excited to see that there is now an opportunity to build housing under that plan. And uh, you know, in th this is a this is a neighborhood that we have heard from others speaking in support has underbuilt housing for decades and has a severe housing shortage right now, as does. Um, many other parts of New York City. And so I'm very excited that this is an opportunity to add a significant, um, significantly greater number of housing units, um, particularly affordable housing units that uh, exceeds the number built in, in the last several decades. So I'm asking that the LPC support this project and uh, approve moving forward with the full 100 housing units. Uh, I do think that this is appropriate for this neighborhood and is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Robin Standifer. Robin Standifer will be followed by Stephen Alish. Uh, Robin Standifer, I will be promoting you to panelists, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hello, this is Robin Standifer. Um, I'm one of the partners in a design practice called Roman and Williams. And um, we, um, my partner who will speak next, Stephen Alish, we are very much in support of this project. Thank you, LPC, for hearing us today. Um, we are part of the Canal Street sort of gentrification. We have a shop there and a gallery, and we very much, and, and our, our offices actually are across the street. And we think that the sensitivity about how this building interacts with a historic building, as well as some of the details on this building, the depth of the windows, how they dealt with um, hiding the mechanical, really all show a serious sensitivity to the traditional architecture in the neighborhood, as well as, as the last speaker discussed, giving very much needed housing to the neighborhood and creating um, a meaningful residential community on Canal Street. Um, so we're very happy to see this happen and we're very happy to see the evolution of Canal Street. And we really recommend 
in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker will be Stephen Alish. Uh, Stephen Alish, I will be promoting you to a panelist, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you'll have three minutes for your testimony. Stephen Alish will be followed by Michelle Coppersmith. Stephen Alish, will you please unmute your microphone? There. Okay, hello, sorry. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, I'm Stephen Alish, Roman and Williams, and I also am in favor of the building. I think the uh, detailing on it is great. I'm so happy to see the lower building being saved. Um, and taken care of um, and activated and not just being used as sort of a historic screen, but actually just, you know, renovated. Um, so really happy about that. And I think the articulation of the pilasters and the windows just feels very New York. I'm so happy it's not a glass box. It's so happy um, that this hybrid of a historical uh, contemporary language is becoming more um, in use uh, with architects uh, and with Morris and with L uh, LPC sort of um, engaging with that massing is really uh, great to see. So thank you for having a chance to talk. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, our next speaker will be Michelle Coppersmith followed by Douglas Hanau. Uh, Michelle Coppersmith, I will be promoting you to the role of panelists after which we request for you to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes. Michelle Coppersmith, would you please use the raise hand function so that we can promote you to speaker? Right, I'm not seeing Michelle Coppersmith present, so we'll be moving for now to the next speaker, uh, Douglas Hanau. Douglas Hanau, would you please use the raise hand feature so that we can promote you to panelists? To the next registered speaker, we have uh, Christina Conroy. Uh, Christina Conroy, would you please uh, unmute yourself and state your name for the record once promoted to panelists, and you will have three minutes to speak. Uh, Christina will be followed by uh, Mark Diller. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society New York. Now, the Victorian Society finds this proposal generally appropriate. By incorporating traditional forms and details in the design of the addition, the resulting building is a unified whole consistent within itself. The alternative, which we see all too often, is an addition appearing to be a separate building of a wildly different style stacked on top of the original. We have, however, three suggestions for improvement. First, we recommend reducing the height by one or two floors to make the new building more consistent with the heights of the existing tall buildings at this end of Houston Street. Second, the cornice should be strengthened and given a greater projection. Finally, we urge that the storefronts proposed for the master plan be more restorative of the original design rather than the generic design proposed. The original design should be replicated or the new storefronts should be designed to be typical of original storefronts in buildings of this age and type. This will help draw attention to the historic portion of the building. 
the level of restoration seems reasonable to us considering the significant additional floor area this proposal will generate. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you for your testimony. Um, our next speaker will be Mark Diller. Mark Diller, I will be moving to the role of panelists, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you will have three minutes for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Mark Diller. I am appearing, I have appeared before you in other capacities today. I am before you as the district manager for Community Board 2 in Manhattan, in which this project is located. Um, I am here because um, our resolution may not have gotten to you in time. So I want to make sure we're on the record, although it turns out that we are fortunate to have uh, the borough president cleaning up for us. So uh, I believe he uh, accurately summarized our resolution, but I want to make sure that we're clear on that. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, offer our board's thanks to uh, the Morris Ajme architects, to Higgins Quaysparth, and to Kassirer for um, a very long and detailed presentation and a, um, uh, a very helpful uh, uh, vetting of this project at our Landmarks Committee. Um, with that said, um, I will just provide you the, uh, the, the, the conclusions that are reached by our Landmarks Committee and which have been endorsed unanimously by our full board. Uh, CB2 recommends A, approval of the restoration of the existing building, the vertical enlargement and the rooftop structure. B, denial of the master plan for commercial ground floor infill unless the size of the letters is reduced and that the, that the illumination is of the HALO system that has been approved by the commission in similar instances in the district. And there is a provision that implementation of the master plan is overseen by LPC staff to ensure that the number of individual letter signs and blade signs does not result <clears throat> in a cluttered appearance. And C, that consideration be given to having uh, discussions with MTA concerning ADA access to the subway and incorporating this provision into the entrance design. With that, I thank you for the opportunity to present. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Uh, from what I see on our roster, that concludes the uh, previously registered uh, online testifiers. We have a couple of additional people in uh, among our attendees on Zoom who have raised their hands to speak. Um, the next speaker will be Pete Davies. Pete Davies, I'll be moving you to the role of panelist, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you will have three minutes to your testimony. Pete Davies will be followed by Deborah Y. Hello, and thank you. My name is Pete Davies. Broadway Residents Coalition in Soho. Uh, I'd like to speak to a few aspects of this application. Generally, uh, Morris Ajmi's plan has a number of very positive um, aspects to it, but I do want to direct you to um, slide 14 uh, in regard to the bulk which shows 837 Washington, which was a Morris Ajmi uh, addition in the Meatpacking District, which the original design submitted to Landmarks was reduced in size because it was viewed as too large and not appropriate for the district. I think the commissioners should give some attention to that similar situation here. Um, also, on the signage, as mentioned by the borough president, uh, the signage at the retail base is proposed at 24 inches high for each letter. That is excessive, it seems. Uh, the 
more general in the district is 18 inches. Uh, it was also noted that the uh, internally illuminated signage as proposed is not appropriate and that the halo lighting is a much more appropriate within the district and fits within the context of what is found in the district and what we have often pushed for and been granted by the Landmarks Commission. Uh, third, if you could look at slide 13, you will find that there is indication on that map of the easement that exists below the property for the MTA due to the construction of the subway station. Slide 17 notes that this building is the result of transportation improvements over the years and more modern transportation improvements would include the addition of ADA access into that subway station below. And we really hope that a provision in the master plan is made to accommodate whatever might be needed to give ADA access to this site, much needed, and now the policy of the city to be a more um, inclusionary way of providing public transportation to all the people in New York City. Uh, that pretty much covers the things that I want to say. Um, we look forward to your discussion and thank you for the time. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker uh, is going to be Deborah Y. Uh, Deborah Y, I'll be promoting you to the role of panelists, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself and state your name for the record, and you will have three minutes for your testimony. Deborah, why uh, we asked for you to press the three dots to unmute yourself. The, oh, I do go to the three dots. I'm, it says that she's unmuted. Okay. <laughs> okay. We hear you. Okay. Um, I'm Deborah Y, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative. Lespi is generally reticent to support large additions to buildings in historic districts. In this case, however, the scale of the historic building is substantially lower than surrounding structures, and its vernacular design does not, in our opinion, prohibit a sensitively designed addition. That said, Lesby objects to the height of the current proposal, which seems overpowering for this location, particularly next to the five adjacent historic buildings on Canal Street. A tower of fewer stories would be more appropriate here. Also importantly, we believe that any addition should be set back slightly from the historic building's street facades to give that building a greater presence. In the current proposal, the original structure gets somewhat lost. We support the use of textured brick on the proposed facade as it harmonizes with the historic building, as well as the building next door and others on the Canal Street block. However, we believe that there should be further study of the top portion of the addition a stronger termination could give it a more distinctive appearance. Finally, we support the planned restoration of the historic building, including the improvements to the subway entrance with areas for artworks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, if there are any other members of the uh, Zoom attendees who would like to testify, please use the raise hand function. Okay, our next speaker will be Sherida Paulson. Sherida Paulson, I'll be promoting you to the role of panelists, after which we ask for you to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. You all have three minutes for your testimony. Hello, can you hear me? Indeed. 
Thank you. This is Sherita Paulson of PKSB Architects. I'm here today to support this application wholeheartedly. Um, first, because the ownership and design team have proven again and again their respect for historic buildings and strong ability to design new buildings. Um, and this is largely a new building, but also because the design of the building is very appropriate to the Soho Historic District. And this site is very unique in its position at the edge of the district. So I hope that the commissioners vote to support this and look forward to seeing it built. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. If any other members of the Zoom participants would like to testify, please use the raise hand function now. All right, I'm not seeing any more raised hands, so that concludes our online testimony portion of the item. Thank you, Stephen. All right, I'd like to turn back to the applicant team and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Thank you. Um, uh, maybe I'll start and then Boris can, can speak a little bit about the, the design and some of the specific comments about the design. Um, but I first wanted to say that um, we've shared this presentation widely and it has been such a fascinating conversation. It's been um, really gratifying to hear how well received the project has been. And we thank everyone for their for their time um, and, and support for the project. Um, I think, um, First, starting with the question of the storefronts and signage, um, you know, the, the, the idea here is to restore the piers and have a contemporary insertion um, in terms of the storefront infill. It's a very simple, minimal design. And so it's, it's an intentional move um, to have that sort of presence at the, at the base of the building. And again, the signage, um, it, 18 inches is allowable as part of the rules, as is halo lit, but we are um, projecting out from the storefront. So there, it's a technical issue, but halo lit doesn't work as well because it's sitting on a ledge in front of the breeze as opposed to being mounted directly into the terracotta, which we, we don't want to do and technically can't as part of the rules. Um, so it's, it's a sort of intentional effort to provide that visibility, the regularity, and again, it's Canal Street, um, not Murphy Street, not Green Street. Um, we are dealing with a very different context and a, and a kinetic and dynamic level um, that this signage is, is viewed against. And there it's, it has an important presence. Um, uh, and, um, I think someone there there are questions about reducing the height of the building. I think compositionally, what we're looking at is a you know a three-story base and how that works, how it works in relation to the overall design scheme. Um, and it, we've done this very carefully and tried to understand um, what the height and um, bulk relationships are with the the Broadway context. And this is again twenty feet shorter than the tallest building. It is certainly not the tallest, but it's designed to be in the character of those tall buildings. Um, every, and I understand you don't um, acknowledge or can't consider use, but reducing the height of the building eliminates the housing units. And that's the goal of this project. There's a larger civic need being addressed here. Um, and you're, considering a project that is within the scale and the context of the Broadway streetscape. Um, the note about, um, someone mentioned 837 um, uh, Washington Street, and yes, it was reduced in height at the commission, um, but it also was, I believe, aside from one other building, the tallest um, building to be constructed in, in the district. So there was a there was a, a prevailing scale question, and there's a prevailing scale question here, and we think we're within that that height and scale um, um, uh, limitation. Um, and then I think just the the question about um, the juxtaposition of the lower rise buildings along Canal and Broadway. This is inherent in the district. Those three generations of buildings all exist side by side. You have two and three story buildings adjacent to 
12 story buildings. It's it's a characteristic of the district and it's very much what makes it such a dynamic place to experience. And so I think the, the idea that we should reduce the height um, in order to be more consistent with the buildings adjacent to it is sort of counter to what the physical fabric tells us. Um, and so maybe Morris, do you want to jump up? Do it real quick. Thank you for all the comments. Um, I would just like to really, really iterate that we believe that the height is right and we have a variety of different heights and organizations with the facade. And I think it works as discussed with the overall organization of other buildings at the same scale in the district. Um, and I think this is very different than the approach at 837. Uh, and that at the end came down to inches, not stories. Um, but I, I would also say that this is a unified design and we feel like the approach to integrate the existing building into the base of this building works really well and the proportions uh, work as well. Regarding the rooftop, um, well, I'll start at the roof and I'll jump down to the base and then go back down. Um, I think that the strip back approach is correct if you wanted the top story to read as the most um, exuberant part of the building and not to compromise that by trying to spread that um, to the uh, penthouse, which is set back and minimally visible for most points, as seen earlier. Um, <clears throat> uh, so there was a question about the street wall. We think that this, in, in many other instances, um, is is uh, better with a building that appears to be one building with one consistent street wall. It is set back slightly. We also introduced a cornice at the top of the existing building to sort of terminate the that part of the base and then introduce the next intermediate portion um, as well. Um, Colors and materials. Um, I think the bronze tone is sometimes tricky, but we've used it successfully. Certainly would um, be open to more terracotta, always open to more terracotta, um, but I'll wait for your comments. Um, and then in terms of the storefronts, I can see those in contrast to the uh, penthouse, I can see those being slightly more articulated or historic, uh, uh, whereas I don't think that's appropriate at the uh, penthouse. Thank you. And also, I also want to thank Christopher Courtney, who I had to mention earlier from our team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay. So um, why don't we move to close the hearing and begin our discussion? Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So, so move. Thank you. And Commissioner Master, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And I think this is a really interesting and exciting project for us as preservationists and um, thinking about uh, how you add to a historic building and what the you know, appropriateness of that is in terms of its size, scale, materials, texture, design, um, but also to think about how our work in preservation intersects with our larger city goals. And I think that um, it's an exciting opportunity for us to be a part of that discussion. And we have this um, three-story commercial building on the corner of sort of a gateway corner of Canal and Broadway. And I think the applicants really presented very clearly its place within this district and sort of, I, I was very impressed and sort of persuaded by the kind of narrative or the analysis of the sort of three character defining phases of development and the building typologies that represent those phases and really the, the size and design of those materials, but the size and scale also <laughs> reflect those periods are sort of inherent in those periods. Um, and then uh, as you move into the 20th century, and as the report talks about a significant slowdown in uh, new construction and changes uh, in the development history and even some decline, um, that there are some buildings that were built, but they're not defined necessarily by their size or and uh, the typologies can uh, be of uh, three stories, or as was shown in the presentation, another building of this period, which was significantly taller. 
And so I think this is an exciting opportunity for us to think about growth in our historic districts and how to do that in an appropriate way. So um, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Again, Commissioner Ginsburg, would you like to start? Uh, very much so. First of all, I want to compliment the applicants on a really thorough and thoughtful presentation and design. And I really have just a few comments. On the rooftop penthouse, I might look, instead of having the setback be brick, looking at it as the material from the chemical and the above to more clearly differentiate it, and something that could be worked with the staff. I actually think the signage, the issue is Canal Street may not be quite Times Square, but it has a certain funky tonic and uh, aggressive nature where your signage needs to be big enough to be noticed. So I really don't have an issue with that. And then finally, and this is as much for our staff for the future, with the new requirement that when you go when you're within 60, I think it's 60 feet of a subway station, you have to go to the MTA and they can say, we want to reserve space for an elevator, et cetera. That should happen before you come to the commission, ideally, because what I'm worried about is you go to the MTA and they say, oh, yeah, we need to see you, and you don't have to come back to them. And zoning changes that are allowed with that. But besides that, I think this is very important and we're very happy to support it. Thank you. Commissioner Goldblum. Uh, I want to first of all echo some of the things that you said, uh, Sarah. I think that this is an, it's a very important project and a very important site and a, and a big precedent for the hopeful development of increased uh, residential capacity in this district. It's really a test you know, by, by making the zoning change in a district that is uh, dominated in some ways by, by a historic district, it kind of throws the gauntlet down to us and say, all right, let's see how we can make this work. And and I I, I think about this project very much in that context. And um I I think it's it's an interesting project in many, many ways. And and let, let me say first of all, I think that the the uh, concept of building such a uh, extensive addition onto a base of this nature is uh, uh, appropriate. Um, we've talked about that in the past in many venues. Um, you know, there's the, uh, the Samson building model, which we looked at. There's the uh, Hearst building model uh, there. And, and there's this, this is much more, we saw one, we saw another thing like this, where there was like a burned down uh, husk or a base left and they extended it. Um, so this is much more of a let's put the building back and let's re-envision the building as, as a real base to another building and not as a podium for a sculpture or something like that. Um, so I think it's an appropriate approach. Um, I think that the selection of the period to which uh, this should be analogous is also appropriate. I think that the, the uh, presence and character of those later large buildings is very uh, uh, much a piece of this district and it's very characteristic, very, very charismatic. Um, I, and, and I think my, my, my thoughts on the building are related to that uh, precedent as a kind of conceptual framework for the building. Um, I think that the restoration of the base is all perfectly good. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the storefronts. I think that the signage, I think the applicant could explore, in my view, uh, expanding the degree and amplitude of the signage with the staff by looking at Canal Street and thinking about where it sits on the spectrum between uh, Muir and Times Square. I think that they can, they can look with staff as to what that could be, should be. And I would be in favor of something that was more creative and uh, maybe a little bit more aggressive. Uh, I don't know if that would apply to the Broadway side. I think again, staff look at that in a more systemic way. But I think that thinking about signage on Canal Street as a sweet generous is a good idea. 
uh, and having our regulation reflect that. I think that's a good idea. Um, I think that the choice of windows and detailing on the base will all find that additional corners will all find. Uh, the building itself, I think, you know, there's kind of mild Morris and intense Morris. I think this was a mild Morris. And I think it should be a little more than intense Morris. I think that if you look at the buildings uh, that, that are, you know, that are, that are of this type in the district, they're characterized by a certain three-dimensional boldness of decoration and of, of, of shadow play that's missing here. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that, that this should be a replication uh, of, uh, of an earlier uh, historical style. It shouldn't be a Beaux-Arts or Neo anything. I think it's fine being what it is, but um, uh, in the course of the presentation, I happened to drift upon uh, the Scholastic Building and thinking about that, which I know is familiar to the applicant. Um, and, and you know, the kind of three-dimensional depth and boldness of some of its gestures, not that they should be replicated necessarily, I think would be appreciated. If you look at the buildings that they cited, the depth of the corners, the depth of the decoration, especially at the top story, of the, uh, the capital, so to speak, of the base shaft capital analogy, um, I think is missing here. Uh, and I think that that depth and that variation and kind of complexity and richness could be achieved either by increasing the depth of the, of the windows to the to the, the skin or by increasing the texture of the skin or doing other things. I think that the, the zoning, the, the building code is, is quite the forgiving in, in regards to cornice depth and landmark districts. And I think the applicant should take advantage of that to give this building more of a, uh, more shadow, more top, more weight. Uh, I think that the, um, the kind of general breakdown of design is appropriate. The, the introduction of a second the base story uh, and then a, a, a shaft here, a shaft and a, a, a top. I think the top could, again, looking at the examples that they showed of kind of typical, typical uh, buildings this, of, of their precedent period, often showed double height uh, tops and not just single height tops. And I think again, from a scale perspective, it would it would take this building out of the out of the mild and to the into the bold, and I think that would be appropriate. Um, I think that the color needs to be looked at. I think they both the color of the terracotta and the brick. It's like it's an almost match. I don't think it's a match, and I don't think it's a contrast. And I think it might look like a boob. So I think that the applicant can work with staff on, on, on finding either a match, or and it's not exact, it's not a very hard brick to match, or making a purposefully different uh, color arrangement. I think the texture brick is always wonderful. And I think that the terracotta choice to have it match, I don't know, for me, that just goes to the don't look at me part. I mean, this is way too big to be don't look at me. I think it's got to be bold and assertive. And I think that, you know, Windermere is a great example, um, you know, although that was all original. But I, I think that, you know, that kind of uh, carrying up of contrast and uh, decorative, decorative elements will make this a more successful integration. Um, and I, I think that the, for me, the height is, is fine. Um, I would say that the, the height, should, if, if the zoning allowed, which it doesn't, should go taller. I, I think that the, the presence of noticeable setbacks on buildings in this district is not very strong. I think you have water towers, I think you have other things, occasional elevator shafts, but I don't, I don't associate this district with visible uh, and houses, and this is visible because the distance you can get from it on both streets. So, I mean, I, for me, uh, you know, either you increase the cornice height and depth, thereby limiting its view, or you do what Mark was suggesting, or you just make it for another story. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner Alfred Smith. Um, I agree with all the comments that have been said so far. It's this is a, a very important, very good application. I was also, as the conservancy mentioned, very concerned about the <clears throat> about the rezoning and what the ramifications of that were going to be. Um, but I think this is a, a really good example of how well it can be done. It should be done. Um, I think very important to have kept this modest three-story building to anchor this new addition 
And I think the decision to go straight up and not set it back was the right one. Um, I think that the height is appropriate. And I was actually thinking something similar to Commissioner Goldblum that the penthouse addition is an anomaly in this district and a two-story attic level at the top is more tr traditional. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, I don't know if the FAR would, would, would allow for that similar it was maybe more floor area than they can do, but I think that would that would help um, even more accentuate the, the top, the crown of the building. And I agree with uh, Commissioner Goldblum on the on the that it could stand more detail. I mean, I think it's appropriate the way it is, but if there's a appetite for it, I think it could be enriched with some more detail. And I think that top floor, it would be nice to articulate the windows a bit more to help that really read as a more sort of that attic reading of the, the density at the top. Um, I was a little concerned about the, the sort of blandness of the storefronts, but, um, you know, I guess, you know, again, you could introduce a transom to sort of help give some more articulation to the, to the ground floor. Um, and then originally I was off, put off by the height of the signage, but in thinking about the, context on Canal Street, I, I think that the signage can be more robust and I think it would be nice for it to be a little more creative than just letters that they show here, but that could be worked out with, with the staff and with tenants as they come along. But I think it's a really good application. Yeah. Sorry, one thing. I really think that the uh, change in window spaces is I think that it looks, I think it's, it's so close to what's in the base. And it's so distinct in the face that I kind of tried hard time to take some extra I I personally think that the even equal, equal, equal on, on the on the upper story. I think we just personally I think it's a strong way to go. Right, Commissioner Chu. Yeah, I think that there was a lot of really good comments that I agree with from the previous three commissioners. Um, I can summarize my thoughts or additional thoughts in a few categories. I think the mass is appropriate. I think we do need to get accustomed to a greater mass and, and start to think about the city and, and the need for more bulk. And I think this is just the start and that will be further and further buildings that will start to back, bulk out. That being said, if I look at the design that's proposed, I think it is quite appropriate. I do have some minor comments. I completely agree about the top of the building design. I think it is a very simple, uh, proportionally, I feel comfortable with the mass, but I do feel that the top is too simplistic. I, I think that we've got a historic base that you built, a three-story historic base, you built a big addition on it, but I feel like when you when you analyzed even the horizontal datums and how you transition from the base up, I thought that was very useful. And I find that bridge level right above the existing extremely useful. And I was noting it before you even mentioned how useful that was. I do feel that the shaft kind of just can keep going on. And that the reason I'm feeling that way is in terms of materiality, I wonder if you might have too many materials. And that is, you've got terracotta, you've got textured brick, you have an existing brick that's a different color. You've got a stone uh, that's around the ornamentation of brick, and you've got a painted metal panel, which is a spandrel panel in the shaft portion. I do think that maybe keeping consistency and singularity and expression more texture, but not using a lot of materials may give you a stronger reading and more iconic. Um, I think the spandrels from the shaft portion should be different from the big horizontal that divides the sections. But I do think that the similarity in material and reflection of light may help unify what when I look at the building, the thing that I always look at is the amount of mass and masonry that the historic buildings all have. This has a little more percentage of glass. If I feel that the rest of the materials are too disparate and too many, it starts to break apart. And I want to see some fabric that keeps the existing historic building going up. There, there are aesthetic things that don't require a lot of changes, really more about profiles and finish selection. 
I completely agree with uh, Commissioner Goldblum on the top condition. I felt similarly that the components needed to be more significant. I look at some of the smaller scale four story structures and their forms is almost as big as the one on this massive bulk. And that's where I feel like it needs more presence. I think the penthouse does feel a little jumbled of volumes on top. And I agree that if that could somehow be incorporated to a more significant top in a singular gesture, that would probably make the design even more prominent um, as opposed to having what I feel is not an expression at the top floor and then a jumble of boxes that then confuse it more. So it's, I think it's just what you've got, refine it more, make it stronger is, is my comment. The storefronts below, I agree that they feel, um, I feel like they feel a little spindly. I, you know, this building is not of an existing fabric that has a lot of ornamentation, but I think again, the light and shadow and depth can do a lot for you. You don't need a lot of mullions and in, in ornamentation in that elevation, but I do think having some significant steps helps to shadow read because that first floor is distinguished from every floor above very specifically and intentionally. And I agree with, again, Commissioner Goldblum's comic, you don't need to drag that down there. That could be its own specific identity. With its bespoke signage, that can be more playful, but don't go too crazy because it doesn't want to feel like you did an elegant building and someone threw crazy signage on your building. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Commissioner Master. Yes, I want to um, uh, say that I agree with the other commissioner's statements, in particular, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, and I want to address just two things that were some critiques from the community. Um, one was the critique of the height of the building. Um, I think that we have seen from the, I think the streetscape that they had shown that I don't think that it's out of proportion for where it's located. So I just want to support that I think that the height of the building is appropriate. Um, the second critique I think that we heard from the community was the signage. Um, and, you know, my feeling is that this is a very busy, bustling um, neighborhood. And given the history of what type of signage there was here, I think we can go bold. And as Albert has said, in these uncertain retail times, we need to give these retailers every tool that we can to succeed. Um, so I can find this appropriate. Commissioner Jefferson. Yeah, I... Um... I must commend the architects because um, it's really a well thought through project. And, and, and the presence of the building, when I looked at this last night, I thought, God, it has such a strong presence at the corner. I think the height is fine. I think the, um, uh, the building on the base is fine. I think what they did uh, uh, historically works well. Um, the master plan idea works, it's a good idea. And the signage, I agree with my fellow commissioners, it doesn't have to be funky, but it could be, you know, a little more fun. The shadow issue, um, you know, the, the, the base could be, the base is fine, the middle is softer, and then they have these two uh, shadow lines that I see on the top. And, I don't know. I think shadows, I think what they did is, I think it's fine. Um, in terms of the penthouse, I think the language of the penthouse is too complex, should be simplified. And I would add, make it, it just the language that we use, but just too complex, keep it simple. But I think it's a good effort. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Latvi. Um, so, first of all, all the my fellow commissioners have done have like made great observations. Um, and uh, I'm going to add to them a little bit, but I also want to step back and just talk about uh, conceptually what's going on here. First of all, I want to uh, I want to say something uh, complimentary to the applicant and the team. You know, this is not your first rodeo with us on this, this street. Al, I guess your family 
has owned quite a few properties here. And or and I really um, appreciate the, you know, the thinking and approach that you have applied to every single project that you have brought to us. Um, and, and I believe that you've assembled a team that has helped you tremendously to be uh, respectful of what exists, what's around it, um, and do it in a way that helps you achieve your goals and enables us to uh, enables us to uh, you know work with you in a, in a very positive way that benefits uh, the landscape of the city. And also, uh, I'm just going to say the sort of the economic development impact that these buildings have on the landscape, which is very, very important. And that is, again, you're, you're before us again to kind of do the same thing at a very interesting time um, in the city's, uh, uh, I mean, real estate you know, uh, state uh, at a time when uh, nobody's really building housing, actually. And so it is commendable that you've brought a project to us that is not only doing that, but is uh, doing it in a way that's adding housing that is diversified um, and is going to diversify the landscape in the neighborhood on a number of levels, not, not only in terms of people who are living there, but in terms of the, the impact on what happens at the street level, which, which is a very imp important to the livelihood of a neighborhood and more broadly, the city as a whole. So, um, so I just wanted to say that I also think that what's one uh, one of the wonderful I, I do love the fact that you are I don't know why that it's be, that this building is being built over a subway I just do love it and I do appreciate the comments that um, that Mark Diller and others have made about making sure that uh, it's accessible. Uh, but uh, but I also think what's happening here is I mean this is actually a very important corner, uh, and um, so I think that you're defining um, an edge uh, that uh, need that not only can stand what you're putting there in terms of height and bulk, but also that kind of caps off the street at a very, very important point and intersection. And you're doing it in a way because it's kind of on a, you know, an edge, it's not on the complete edge of canal, but it's on a very important edge. I mean, everybody, some, you know, somehow goes up and down, goes down Broadway. And it's an important cross section and intersection right here in this neighborhood, between neighborhoods, um, through neighborhoods. So I think um, that's uh, also, you know, important. And I think you're not, um, you're not overdoing it. I think it's a great capstone. And I actually really appreciate the restraint that was used in the design of this building. Because I think that what it does is it, it in general speaks to, to the architecture that is around it, but in no way is trying to get in the way of it. Um, so it's a wonderful compliment, um, and, but I don't think it necessarily has to make any kind of overstatement. I do 
appreciate the, you know, the use of materials here, the textured brick and of course the terracotta. So it's important, you know, because it relates to this wonderful base, which, you know, you didn't have to come to us and say, we're going to keep the space. I think it is fantastic that you did. And I think the way you've pieced it together and the fact that you've drawn from what's there in the design is uh, wonderful. I, 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 um, I like this idea that Commissioner Chu had of like simplifying the materials because as I said, this is a restrained design and it, it, it really speaks more to that. Um, but I also do agree that the cornice of this building <laughs> could use a, a, a little more emphasis than it has because um, it, ju it just can. And I also agree with the comment that the, um, that the, I think there should be a little bit of a simplification in, uh, in the penthouse at the top. I think it is just, as, as you said, Everardo, a little bit too uh, jumbly. Um, and uh, so I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you. I think this was a really great discussion. So thank oh, you. Actually, that's something yeah. I wanna say. I'm so sorry. I do wanna talk about the signage. I. I actually don't think the signage should go crazy because that is not what this building is about. And I think it's not really going to go. And I do think also because of the location, you're on the edge and you could be a little more understated. And I think it would work very, very well. So that's it. Now I'm really done. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. So I, we've had some really great comments. I think what you've heard is uh, a lot of support for this project here. Um, this conceptually, I think, has been totally embraced by the commission as an appropriate approach to uh, expand this particular building at, at this particular location in this particular historic district, given the development history and the typologies that we find in the district. And so a vertical straight up expansion um, is, uh, I think, found to be appropriate by all commissioners at this particular height, which is uh, based on the heights of other tall buildings in the district and has a proportional system as well that relates to the taller buildings a proportional system within itself that relates to the composition of taller buildings. Uh, but, and uh, so I think that this is a very successful um, proposal that we're happy to review today. And I think it allows us to uh, get and welcome restoration to the base of the building that might not otherwise happen um, and allows us to also uh, be active participants in some of these larger uh, citywide goals so and much needed goals um, but we have heard some comments about how the uh, new building could be better integrated into the base uh, through some uh, I think really refinements uh, both at the the shaft as well as at the penthouse and we've had some thoughts on signage and storefronts so we'll uh, take no action today and we'll give you an opportunity to think about some of those refinements and come back to us as soon as you're ready. So, all right, great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Okay. And uh, we're going to break for lunch now. Uh, we will come back at 2 10 and we'll ask all members who are participating remotely to voluntarily exit the meeting at this time and rejoin the meeting at 2 10. And uh, we'll see everybody for the afternoon session.